Section 24 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 2. The Temples and the Gods of Chaldea, Part 11. The supplications having been heard, water was brought to the gods for the necessary ablutions before a repast. Wash thy hands, cleanse thy hands, may the gods thy brothers wash their hands. From a clean dish eat a pure repast, from a clean cup drink pure water. The statue, from the rigidity of the material out of which it was carved, was at a loss how to profit by the exquisite things which had been lavished upon it. The difficulty was removed by the opening of its mouth at the moment of consecration, thus enabling it to take part of the good fare to its satisfaction. The banquet lasted a long time, and consisted of every delicacy which the culinary skill of the time could prepare. The courses consisted of dates, wheat and flour, honey, butter, various kinds of wines and fruits, together with roast and boiled meats. In the most ancient times it would appear that even human sacrifices were offered, but this custom was obsolete except on rare occasions, and lambs, oxen, sometimes swine's flesh, formed the usual elements of the sacrifice. The god seized, as it arose from the altar, the unctuous smoke, and fed on it with a delight. When they had finished their repast, the supplication of a favor was adroitly added, to which they gave a favorable hearing. Services were frequent in the temples. There was one in the morning, and another in the evening on ordinary days, in addition to those which private individuals might require at any hour of the day. The festivals assigned to the local god and his colleagues, together with the acts of praise in which the whole nation joined, such as that of the new year, required an abundance of extravagant sacrifices, in which the blood of the victims flowed like water. Days of sorrow and mourning alternated with these days of joy, during which the people and the magnates gave themselves up to severe fasting and acts of penitence. The Chaldeans had a lively sense of human frailty, and of the risks entailed upon the sinner by disobedience to the gods. The dread of sinning haunted them during their whole life. They continually subjected the motives of their actions to a strict scrutiny, and once self-examination had revealed to them the shadow of an evil intent, they were accustomed to implore pardon for it in a humble manner. Lord, my sins are many, great are my misdeeds. O oh, my God, my sins are many, great my misdeeds. O oh, my goddess, my sins are many, great my misdeeds. I have committed faults, and I knew them not. I have committed sin, and I knew it not. I have fed upon misdeeds, and I knew them not. I have walked in omissions, and I knew them not. The Lord, in the anger of his heart, he has stricken me. The God, in the wrath of his heart, has abandoned me. Ishtar is enraged against me, and has treated me harshly. I make an effort, and no one offers me a hand. I weep, and no one comes to me. I cry aloud, and no one hears me. I sink under affliction. I am overwhelmed. I can no longer raise up my head. I turn to my merciful God to call upon him, and I groan. Lord, reject not thy servant, and if he is hurled into the roaring waters, stretch to him thy hand. The sins I have committed have mercy upon them. The misdeeds I have committed scatter them to the winds, and my numerous faults tear them to pieces like a garment." Sin in the eyes of the Chaldean was not, as with us, an infirmity of the soul. It assaulted the body like an actual virus, and the fear of physical suffering or death engendered by it inspired these complaints with a note of sincerity which cannot be mistaken. Every individual is placed, from the moment of his birth, under the protection of a god and goddess, of whom he is the servant, or rather the son, and whom he never addresses otherwise than as his god and his goddess. These deities accompany him night and day, not so much to protect him from visible dangers, as to guard him from the invisible beings which ceaselessly hover round him, and attack him on every side. If he is devout, piously disposed towards his divine patrons and the deities of his country, if he observes the prescribed rites, recites the prayers, performs the sacrifices, in a word, if he acts rightly, their aid is never lacking, they bestow upon him a numerous posterity, a happy old age, prolonged to the term fixed by fate, when he must resign himself to close his eyes forever to the light of day. If, on the contrary, he is wicked, violent, one whose word cannot be trusted, his God cuts him down like a reed, extirpates his race, shortens his days, 
delivers him over to demons who possess themselves of his body and afflict it with sicknesses before finally dispatching him. Penitence is of avail against the evil of sin, and serves to re-establish a right course of life, but its efficacy is not permanent, and the moment at last arrives in which death, getting the upper hand, carries its victim away. The Chaldeans had not such clear ideas as to what awaited them in the other world as the Egyptians possessed, whilst the tomb, the mummy, the perpetuity of the funeral revenues, and the safety of the double, were the engrossing subjects in Egypt, the Chaldean texts are almost entirely silent as to the condition of the soul, and the living seem to have had no further concern about the dead than to get rid of them as quickly and as completely as possible. They did not believe that everything was over at the last breath, but they did not on that account think that the fate of that which survived was indissolubly associated with the perishable part, and that the disembodied soul was either annihilated or survived, according as the flesh in which it was sustained was annihilated or survived in the tomb. The soul was doubtless not utterly unconcerned about the fate of the larva it had quitted. Its pains were intensified on being despoiled of its earthly case, if the latter were mutilated or left without sepulchre, a prey to the fowls of the air. This feeling, however, was not sufficiently developed to create a desire for escape from corruption entirely, and to cause a resort to the mummifying process of the Egyptians. The Chaldeans did not subject the body, therefore, to those injections, to those prolonged baths in preserving fluids, to that laborious swaddling which rendered it indestructible. Whilst the family wept and lamented, old women who exercised the sad function of mourners washed the dead body, perfumed it, clad it in its best apparel, painted its cheeks, blackened its eyelids, placed a collar on its neck, rings on its fingers, arranged its arms upon its breast, and stretched it on a bed, setting up at its head a little altar for the customary offerings of water, incense, and cakes. Evil spirits prowled incessantly around the dead bodies of the Chaldeans, either to feed upon them or to use them in their sorcery. Should they succeed in slipping into a corpse, from that moment it could be metamorphosed into a vampire, and return to the world to suck the blood of the living. The Chaldeans were therefore accustomed to invite by prayers beneficent genie and gods to watch over the dead. Two of these would take their invisible places at the head and foot of the bed, and wave their hands in the act of blessing. These were the vassals of Ea, and like their master were usually clad in fish skins. Others placed themselves in the sepulchre chamber, and stood ready to strike any one who dared to enter. These had human figures, or lions' heads joined to the bodies of men. Others, moreover, hovered over the house in order to drive off the spectres, who might endeavor to enter through the roof. During the last hours in which the dead body remained among its kindred, it reposed under the protection of a legion of gods. We must not expect to find on the plains of the Euphrates the rock-cut tombs, the mastabas or pyramids of Egypt. No mountain chain ran on either side of the river, formed of rock soft enough to be cut and hollowed easily into chambers or sepulchre halls and at the same time sufficiently hard to prevent the tunnels, once cut, from falling in. The alluvial soil upon which the Chaldean cities were built, far from preserving the dead body, rapidly decomposed it under the influence of heat and moisture. Vaults constructed in it would soon be invaded by water in spite of masonry. Paintings and sculpture would soon be eaten away by neater, and the funereal furniture and the coffin quickly destroyed. The dwelling-house of the Chaldean dead could not, therefore, properly be called, as those of Egypt, an eternal house. It was constructed of dried or burnt brick, and its form varied much from the most ancient times. Sometimes it was a great vaulted chamber, the courses forming the roof being arranged corbel-wise, and contained the remains of one or two bodies walled up within it. At other times it consisted merely of an earthen jar, in which the corpse had been inserted in a bent-up posture, or was composed of two enormous cylindrical jars, which, when united and cemented with bitumen, formed a kind of barrel around the body. Other tombs are represented by wretched structures, sometimes oval and sometimes round in shape, placed upon a brick base and covered by a flat or domed roof. The interior was not of large dimensions, and to enter it was necessary to stoop to a creeping posture. The occupant of the smallest chambers was content to have with him his linen, his ornaments, some bronze arrowheads, and metal or clay vessels. Others contained furniture which, though not as complete as that found in Egyptian sepulchres, must have ministered to all the needs of the spirit. 
The body was stretched, fully clothed, upon a mat impregnated with bitumen, the head supported by a cushion or flat brick, the arms laid across the breast, and the shroud adjusted by bands to the loins and legs. Sometimes the corpse was placed on its left side, with the legs slightly bent, and the right hand extending over the left shoulder, was inserted into a vase, as if to convey the contents to the mouth. Clay jars and dishes, arranged around the body, contained the food and drink required for the dead man's daily fare, his favorite wine, dates, fish, fowl, game, and occasionally also a boar's head, and even stone representations of provisions, which, like those of Egypt, were lasting substitutes for the reality. The dead man required weapons also to enable him to protect his food store, and his lance, javelins, and baton of office were placed alongside him, together with the cylinder bearing his name, which he had employed as his seal in his lifetime. Beside the body of a woman or young girl was arranged an abundance of spare ornaments, flowers, scent bottles, combs, cosmetic pencils, and cakes of the black paste, with which they were accustomed to paint the eyebrows and the edges of the eyelids. End of Part 24 Read by Professor Heather and Bumbai. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 25 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 2. The Temples and the Gods of Chaldea, Part 12. Cremation seems in many cases to have been preferred to burial in a tomb. The funeral pile was constructed at some distance from the town, on a specially reserved area in the middle of the marshes. The body, wrapped up in coarse matting, was placed upon a heap of reeds and rushes saturated with bitumen. A brick wall, coated with moist clay, was built around this to circumscribe the action of the flames, and the customary prayers having been recited, the pile was set on fire. Masses of fresh material, together with the funerary furniture and the usual viacticum, being added to the pyre. When the work of cremation was considered to be complete, the fire was extinguished, and an examination made of the residue. It frequently happened that only the most accessible and most easily destroyed parts of the body had been attacked by the flames, and that there remained a black and disfigured mass which the fire had not consumed. The previously prepared coating of mud was then made to furnish a clay covering for the body, so as to conceal the sickening spectacle from the view of the relatives and spectators. Sometimes, however, the furnace accomplished its work satisfactorily, and there was nothing to be seen at the end but greasy ashes and scraps of calcined bones. The remains were frequently left where they were, and the funeral pile became their tomb. They were, however, often collected and disposed of in a manner which varied with their more or less complete combustion. Bodies insufficiently burnt were interred in graves, or in public chapels, while the ashes of those fully cremated, together with the scraps of bones and the debris of the offerings, were placed in long urns. The heat had contorted the weapons and half-melted the vessels of copper, and the deceased was thus obliged to be content with the fragments only of the things provided for him. These were, however, sufficient for the purpose, and his possessions, once put to the test of flames, now accompanied him whither he went. Water alone was lacking, but provision was made for this by the construction on the spot of cisterns to collect it. For this purpose several cylinders of pottery, some twenty inches broad, were inserted in the ground one above the other, from a depth of ten to twelve feet, and the last cylinder, reaching to the level of the ground, was provided with a narrow neck, through which the rain-water or infiltrations from the river flowed into this novel cistern. Many examples of these are found in one and the same chamber, thus giving the soul opportunity to find water in one or other of them. The tombs at Uruk, arranged closely together with coterminous walls, and gradually covered by the sand or by the accumulation and debris of new tombs, came at length to form an actual mound. In cities where space was less valuable, and where they were free to extend, the tombs quickly disappeared without leaving any vestiges above the surface, and it would now be necessary to turn up a great deal of rubbish before discovering their remains. The Chaldea of today presents the singular aspect of a country almost without cemeteries, and one would be inclined to think that its ancient inhabitants had taken pains to hide them. The sepulchre of royal personages alone furnishes us with monuments of which we can determine the site. 
At Babylon these were found in the ancient palaces in which the living were no longer inclined to dwell. That of Shargina, for instance, furnished a burying place for kings more than two thousand years after the death of its founder. The chronicles devoutly indicate the spot where each monarch, when his earthly reign was over, found a last resting place, and where, as the subject of a ceremonial worship similar to that of Egypt, his memory was preserved from the oblivion which had overtaken most of his illustrious subjects. The dead man, or rather that part of him which survived, his Ikemu, dwelt in the tomb, and it was for his comfort that there were provided, at the time of sepulchre or cremation, the provisions and clothing, the ornaments and weapons, of which he was considered to stand in need. Furnished with these necessities by his children and heirs, he preserved for the donors the same affection which he had felt for them in his lifetime, and gave evidence of it in every way he could, watching over their welfare and protecting them from malign influences. If they abandoned or forgot him, he avenged himself for their neglect by returning to torment them in their homes, by letting sickness attack them, and by ruining them with his imprecations. He became thus no less hurtful than the luminous ghost of the Egyptians, and if he were accidentally deprived of sepulchre, he would not merely be a plague to his relations, but a danger to the entire city. The dead who were unable to earn an honest living showed little pity to those who were in the same position as themselves, when a newcomer arrived among them without prayers, libations, or offerings, they declined to receive him, and would not give him so much as a piece of bread out of their meagre store. The spirit of the unburied dead man, having neither place of repose nor means of subsistence, wandered through the town and country, occupied with no other thought than that of attacking and robbing the living. He it was, who gliding into the house during the night, revealed himself to its inhabitants with such a frightful visage as to drive them distracted with terror. Always on the watch, no sooner does he surprise one of his victims than he falls upon him, his head against his victim's head, his hand against his hand, his foot against his foot. He who has been thus attacked, whether man or beast, would undoubtedly perish if magic were not able to furnish its all-powerful defense against this deadly embrace. This human survival, who is so forcibly represented in both his good and evil aspects, was nevertheless nothing more than a sort of vague and fluid existence, a double, in fact, analogous in appearance to that of the Egyptians. With the faculty of roaming at will through space and of going from and returning to his abode, it was impossible to regard him as condemned always to dwell in the case of terracotta in which his body lay mouldering. He was transferred, therefore, or rather he transferred himself, into the dark land, the Aralu, situated very far away, according to some, beneath the surface of the earth, according to others, in the eastern or northern extremities of the universe. A river which opens into this region and separates it from the sunlit earth, finds its source in the primordial waters into whose bosom this world of ours is plunged. This dark country is surrounded by seven high walls, and is approached through seven gates, each of which is guarded by a pitiless warder. Two deities rule within it, Nurgle, the lord of the great city, and Beltus Alat, the lady of the great land, whither everything which has breathed in this world descends after death. A legend relates that Alat, called in Sumerian Erish Kigal, reigned alone in Hades, and was invited by the gods to a feast which they had prepared in heaven. Owing to her hatred of the light, she sent a refusal by her messenger Narntar, who acquitted himself on this mission with such a bad grace, that Anne and Ea were incensed against his mistress, and commissioned Nergal to descend and chastise her. He went, and finding the gates of hell open, dragged the queen by her hair from the throne, and was about to decapitate her, but she mollified him by her prayers, and saved her life by becoming his wife. The nature of Nergal fitted him well to play the part of a prince of the departed, for he was the destroying son of summer, and the genius of pestilence and battle. His functions, however, in heaven and earth, took up so much of his time that he had little leisure to visit his nether kingdom, and he was consequently obliged to content himself with the role of providing subjects for it, by dispatching thither the thousands of recruits, which he gathered daily from the abodes of men, or from the field of battle. Alat was the actual sovereign of the country. She was represented with the body of a woman, ill-formed and shaggy, the grinning muzzle of a lion, and the claws of a bird of prey. She brandished in each hand a large serpent, a real animated javelin, whose poisonous bite inflicted a fatal wound upon the enemy. 
Her children were two lions, which she is represented as suckling, and she passed through her empire, not seated in the saddle, but standing upright or kneeling on the back of a horse, which seems oppressed by her weight. Sometimes she set out on an expedition upon the river which communicated with the countries of light, in order to meet the procession of newly arrived souls ceaselessly dispatched to her. She embarked in this case upon an enchanted vessel, which made its way without sail or oars, its prow projecting like the beak of a bird, and its stern terminating in the head of an ox. She overcomes all resistance, and nothing can escape her. The gods themselves can pass into her empire only on the condition of submitting to death like mortals, and of humbly avowing themselves her slaves. End of Part 25 Read by Professor Heather and By For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Section 26 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 2. The Temples and the Gods of Chaldea, Part 13. The warders at the gates despoiled the newcomers of everything which they had brought with them, and conducted them in a naked condition before Alat, who pronounced sentence upon them, and assigned to each his place in the netherworld. The good or evil committed on earth by such souls was of little moment in determining the sentence. To secure the favor of the judge, it was of far greater importance to have exhibited devotion to the gods and to Alat herself, to have lavished sacrifices and offerings upon them, and to have enriched their temples. The souls which could not justify themselves were subjected to horrible punishment. Leprosy consumed them to the end of time, and the most painful maladies attacked them, to torture them ceaselessly without any hope of release. Those who were fortunate enough to be spared from her rage dragged out a miserable and joyless existence. They were continually suffering from the pangs of thirst and hunger, and found nothing to satisfy their appetites but dust and clay. They shivered with cold, and they obtained no other garment to protect them than mantles of feathers, the great silent wings of the night-birds, invested with which they fluttered about and filled the air with their screams. This gloomy and cruel conception of ordinary life in this strange kingdom was still worse than the idea formed of the existence in the tomb to which it succeeded. In the cemetery the soul was, at least, alone with the dead body. In the house of Alat, on the contrary, it was lost, as it were, among spirits as much afflicted as itself, and among the genie born of darkness. None of these genie had a simple form, or approached the human figure in shape. Each individual was a hideous melody of human and animal parts, in which the most repellent features were artistically combined. Lions' heads stood out from the bodies of scorpion-tailed jackals, whose feet were armed with eagles' claws, and among such monsters the genie of pestilence, fever, and the southwest wind took the chief place. When once the dead had become naturalized among this terrible population, they could not escape from their condition, unless by the exceptional mandate of the gods above. They possessed no recollection of what they had done upon earth. Domestic affection, friendships, and the memory of good offices rendered to one another, all were effaced from their minds. Nothing remained there but an inexpressible regret at having been exiled from the world of light, and an excruciating desire to reach it once more. The threshold of Alat's palace stood upon a spring which had the property of restoring to life all who bathed in it or drank of its waters. They gushed forth as soon as the stone was raised, but the earth spirits guarded it with a jealous care and kept at a distance all who attempted to appropriate a drop of it. They permitted access to it only by order of Ea himself, or one of the supreme gods, and even then with a rebellious heart at seeing their prey escape them. Ancient legends related how the shepherd Dumuzi, son of Ea and Damkina, having excited the love of Ishtar while he was pasturing his flocks under the mysterious tree of Eridu, which covers the earth with its shade, was chosen by the goddess from among all others to be the spouse of her youth, and how, being mortally wounded by a wild boar, he was cast into the kingdom of Alat. One means remained by which he might be restored to the light of day. His wounds must be washed in the waters of this wonderful spring, and Ishtar resolved to go in quest of this marvellous liquid. The undertaking was fraught with danger, for no one might travel to the infernal regions without having previously gone through the extreme terrors of death, and even the gods themselves could not transgress this fatal law. To the land without return, to the land which thou knowest, Ishtar, the daughter of Sin, turned her thoughts, she, the daughter of Sin, turned her thoughts, to the house of darkness, 
the abode of Urkala, to the house from which he who enters can never emerge, to the path upon which he who goes shall never come back, to the house into which he who enters bids farewell to the light, the place where dust is nourishment and clay is food. The light is not seen, darkness is the dwelling, where the garments are the wings of birds, where dust accumulates on door and bolt. Ishtar arrives at the porch. She knocks at it. She addresses the guardian in an imperious voice. Guardian of the waters, open thy gate. Open thy gate, that I may enter, even I. If thou openest not the door that I may enter, even I, I will burst open the door. I will break the bars. I will break the threshold. I will burst in the panels. I will excite the dead that they may eat the living, and the dead shall be more numerous than the living. The guardian opened his mouth and spake. He announced to the mighty Ishtar, Stop, O lady, and do not overturn the door until I go and apprise the queen Alat of thy name. Alat hesitates, and then gives him permission to receive the goddess. Go, guardian, open the gate to her, but treat her according to the ancient laws. Mortals enter naked into the world, and naked they must leave it, and since Ishtar has decided to accept their lot, she too must be prepared to divest herself of her garments. The guardian went, he opened his mouth, Enter, my lady, and may Kutha rejoice, may the palace and the land without return exult in thy presence. He causes her to pass through the first gate, divests her, removes the great crown from her head. Why, guardian, dost thou remove the great crown from my head? Enter, my lady, such is the law of Alat. The second gate, he causes her to pass through it, he divests her, removes the rings from her ears. Why, guardian, dost thou remove the rings from my ears? Enter, my lady, such is the law of Alat. And from gate to gate he removes some ornament from the distressed lady, now her necklace with its attached amulets, now the tunic which covers her bosom, now her enameled girdle, her bracelets, and the rings on her ankles, and at length, at the seventh gate, takes from her her last covering. When she at length arrives in the presence of Alat, she throws herself upon her in order to wrest from her, in a terrible struggle, the life of Dumuzi. But Alat sends for Namtar, her messenger of misfortune, to punish the rebellious Ishtar. Strike her eyes with the affliction of the eyes. Strike her loins with the affliction of the loins. Strike her feet with the affliction of the feet. Strike her heart with the affliction of the heart. Strike her head with the affliction of the head. Strike violently at her, at her whole body. While Ishtar was suffering the torments of the infernal regions, the world of the living was wearing mourning on account of her death. In the absence of the goddess of love, the rites of love could no longer be performed. The passions of animals and men were suspended. If she did not return quickly to the daylight, the races of men and animals would become extinct, the earth would become a desert, and the gods would have neither votaries nor offerings. Popsukal, the servant of the great gods, tore his face before Shamash, clothed in mourning, filled with sorrow. Shamash went. He wept in the presence of Sin, his father, and his tears flowed in the presence of Ea, the king. Ishtar has gone down into the earth, and she has not come up again. And ever since Ishtar has descended into the land without return, the passions of men and beasts have been suspended. The master goes to sleep while giving his command. The servant goes to sleep on his duty. The resurrection of the goddess is the only remedy for such ills, but this is dependent upon the resurrection of Damuzi. Ishtar will never consent to reappear in the world if she cannot bring back her husband with her. Ea, the supreme god, the infallible executor of the divine will, he who alone can modify the laws imposed upon creation, at length decides to accord her what she desires. Ea, in the wisdom of his heart, formed a male being, formed Udushunamir, the servant of the gods. Go then, Udushunamir, turn thy face towards the gate of the land without return, the seven gates of the land without return. May they become open at thine presence. May Alat behold thee, and rejoice in thy presence. When her heart shall be calm, and her wrath appeased, charm her in the name of the great gods, Turn thy thoughts to the spring. May the spring, my lady, give me of its waters that I may drink of them. Alat broke out into a terrible rage, when she saw herself obliged to yield to her rival. She beat her sides, she gnawed her fingers, she broke out into curses against the messenger of misfortune. Thou hast expressed to me a wish which should not be made. Fly, Udushinamar, or I will shut thee up in the great prison. The mud of the drains of the city shall be thy food. The gutters of the town shall be thy drink, the shadow of the walls shall be thy abode, the thresholds shall be thy habitation, confinement and isolation shall weaken thy strength. She is obliged to obey, notwithstanding. 
she calls her messenger Namtar and commands him to make all the preparations for resuscitating the goddess. It was necessary to break the threshold of the palace in order to get at the spring, and its waters would have their full effect only in presence of the Anunas. Namtar went, he rent open the eternal place, he twisted the upright so that the stones of the threshold trembled, he made the Anunnaki come forth, and seated them on thrones of gold, he poured upon Ishtar the waters of life and brought her away. She received again at each gate the articles of apparel she had abandoned in her passage across the seven circles of hell. As soon as she saw the daylight once more, it was revealed to her that the fate of her husband was henceforward in her own hands. Every year she must bathe him in pure water, and anoint him with the most precious perfumes, clothe him in a robe of mourning, and play to him sad airs upon a celestial flute, whilst her priestesses intoned their doleful chants, and tore their breasts in sorrow. His heart would then take fresh life, and his youth flourish once more, from springtime to springtime, as long as she should celebrate on his behalf the ceremonies already prescribed by the deities of the infernal world. Damuzi was a god, the lover, moreover, of a goddess, and the deity succeeded where mortals failed. Ea, Nebo, Gula, Ishtar, and their fellows possessed, no doubt, the faculty of recalling the dead to life, but they rarely made use of it on behalf of their creatures, and their most pious votaries pleaded in vain from temple to temple for the resurrection of their dead friends. They could never obtain the favor which had been granted by Alit to Dumuzi. When the dead god was once placed in the tomb, it rose up no more. It could no more be reinstated in the place in the household it had lost. It never could begin once more a new earthly existence. The necromancers, indeed, might snatch away death's prey for a few moments. The earth gaped at the words of their invocations, the soul burst forth like a puff of wind, and answered gloomily the questions proposed to it. But when the charm was once broken, it had to retrace its steps to the country without return, to be plunged once more in darkness. The prospect of a dreary and joyless eternity was not so terrifying to the Chaldeans as it was to the Egyptians. The few years of their earthly existence were a far more concern to them than the endless ages which were to begin their monotonous course on the morrow of their funeral. The sum of good and evil fortune assigned to them by destiny, they preferred to spend continuously in the light of day, on the fair plains of the Euphrates and Tigris. If they were to economize during this period, with the view of laying up a posthumous treasure of felicity, their store would have no current value beyond the tomb, and would thus become so much waste. The gods, therefore, whom they served faithfully, would recoup them, here in their native city, with present prosperity, with health, riches, power, glory, and a numerous offspring, for the offerings of their devotion, while if they irritated the deities by their shortcomings, they had nothing to expect but overwhelming calamities and sufferings. The gods would cut them down like a reed, and their names would be annihilated, their seed destroyed. They would end their days in affliction and hunger, their dead bodies would be at the mercy of chance, and would receive no sepulchre. They were content to resign themselves, therefore, to the dreary lot of eternal misery, which awaited them after death provided they enjoyed in this world a long and prosperous existence. Some of them felt and rebelled against the injustice of the idea, which assigned one and the same fate, without discrimination, to the coward and the hero killed on the battlefield, to the tyrant and the mild ruler of his people, to the wicked and the righteous. These, therefore, supposed that the gods would make distinctions, that they would separate such heroes from the common herd, welcomed them in a fertile, sunlit island, separated from the abode of men by the waters of death, the impassable river which leads to the house of Alat. The tree of life flourished there, the spring of life poured forth there its reviving waters. Thither Ea transferred Zisustroth after the deluge. Gilgamesh saw the shores of this island and returned from it, strong and healthy as in the days of his youth. The side of this region of delights was at first placed in the centre of the marshes of the Euphrates, where this river flows into the sea. Afterwards, when the country became better known, it was transferred beyond the ocean. In proportion as the limits of the Chaldean horizon were thrust further and further away by mercantile or warlike expeditions, this mysterious island was placed more and more to the east, afterwards to the north, and at length a distance so great that it tended to vanish altogether. As a final resource, the gods of heaven themselves became the hosts, and welcomed into their own kingdom the purified souls of the heroes. End of Part 26 Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Section 27 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 2. The Temples and the Gods of Chaldea, Part 14. These souls were not so securely isolated from humanity that the inhabitants of the world were not at times tempted to rejoin them before their last hour had come. Just as Gilgamesh had dared of old the dangers of the desert and the ocean, in order to discover the island of Kasasadra, so Atana darted through the air in order to ascend to the sky of Anu, to become incorporated while still living in the choir of the blessed. The legend gives an account of his friendship with the eagle of Shamash, and of the many favors he had obtained from and rendered to the bird. It happened at last that his wife could not bring forth the son which lay in her womb. The hero, addressing himself to the eagle, asked from her the plant which alleviates the birth pangs of women, and facilitates their delivery. This was only to be found, however, in the heaven of Anu, and how could any one run the risk of mounting so high, without being destroyed on the way by the anger of the gods? The eagle takes pity upon the sorrow of his comrade, and resolves to attempt the enterprise with him. Friend, she says, banish the cloud from thy face. Come, and I will carry thee to the heaven of the god Anu. Place thy breast against my breast, place thy two hands upon the pinions of my wings, place thy side against my side. He places his breast against the breast of the eagle, he places his two hands upon the pinions of the wings, he places his side against her side, he adjusts himself firmly, and his weight was great. The Chaldean artists have more than once represented the departure of the hero. They exhibit him closely attached to the body of his ally, and holding her in a strong embrace. A first flight has already lifted them above the earth, and the shepherds scattered over the country are stupefied at the unaccustomed sight. One announces the prodigy to another, while their dogs, seated at their feet, extend their muzzles as if in the act of howling with terror. For the space of a double hour the eagle bore him. Then the eagle spake to him, to him, Etana, Behold, my friend, the earth, what it is. Regard the sea which the ocean contains. See, the earth is no more than a mountain, and the sea is no more than a lake the space of a second double hour she bore him then the eagle spake to him to him etana behold my friend the earth what it is the sea appears as the girdle of the earth the space of a third double hour she bore him then the eagle spake to him to him etana see my friend the earth what it is the sea is no more than the rivulet made by a gardener they at length arrive at the heaven of anu and rest there for a moment etana sees around him nothing but empty space no living thing within it not even a bird he is struck with terror, but the eagle reassures him, and tells him to proceed on his way to the heaven of Ishtar. Come, my friend, let me bear thee to Ishtar, and I will place thee near Ishtar the lady, and at the feet of Ishtar the lady thou shalt throw thyself. Place thy side against my side, place thy hands on the pinions of my wings. The space of a double hour she bore them. Friend, behold the earth what it is. The face of the earth stretches out quite flat. The sea is no greater than a mere. The space of a second double hour she bore him. Friend, behold the earth what it is. The earth is no more than a square plot in a garden, and the great sea not greater than a puddle of water. At the third hour Etana lost courage and cried, Stop! and the eagle immediately descended again. But Etana's strength being exhausted, he let go his hold, and was dashed to pieces on the ground. The eagle escaped unhurt this time, but she soon suffered a more painful death than that of Etana. She was at war with the serpent, though the records which we as yet possess do not vouchsafe the reason, when she discovered in the roots of a tree the nest in which her enemy concealed its brood. She immediately proposed to her young ones to pounce down upon the growing snakes. One of her eaglets, wiser than the rest, reminded her that they were under the protection of Shamas, the great writer of wrongs, and cautioned her against any transgression of the divine laws. The old eagle felt herself wiser than her son, and rebuked him after the manner of wise mothers. She carried away the serpent's young, and gave them as food to her own brood. The hissing serpent crawled as far as Shamash, crying for vengeance. The evil she has done me, Shamash, behold it. Come to my help, Shamash. Thy net is as wide as the earth. Thy snares reach to the distant mountain. Who can escape thy net? The criminal Zu, Zu who was the first to act wickedly, did he escape it? Shamash refused to interfere personally, but he pointed out to the serpent an artifice by which he might satisfy his vengeance as securely as if Shamash himself had accomplished it. Set out upon the way, ascend the mountain, 
and conceal thyself in a dead bull. Make an incision in his inside, tear open his belly, take up thy abode, establish thyself in his belly. All the birds of the air will pounce upon it, and the eagle herself will come with them, ignorant that thou art within it. She will wish to possess herself of the flesh, she will come swiftly, she will think of nothing but the entrails within. As soon as she begins to attack the inside, seize her by her wings, beat down her wings, the pinions of her wings, and her claws, tear her and throw her into the ravine of the mountain, that she may die there a death of hunger and thirst. The serpent did as Shamash advised, and the birds of the air began to flock round the carcass in which she was hidden. The eagle came with the rest, and at first kept aloof looking for what should happen. When she saw that the birds flew away unharmed, all fear left her. In vain did the wise eaglet warn her of the danger that was lurking within the prey. She mocked at him and his predictions, dug her beak into the carrion, and the serpent leaped out, seizing her by the wing. The eagle her mouth opened, and spake unto the snake, Have mercy upon me, and according to thy pleasure a gift I will lavish upon thee. The snake opened her mouth, and spake unto the eagle, Did I release thee, Shamash would take part against me, the doom would fall upon me, which I now fulfil upon thee. She tore out her wings, her feathers, her pinions, she tore her to pieces, she threw her into a cleft, and there she died a death of hunger and of thirst. The gods allowed no living being to penetrate with impunity into their empire. He who was desirous of ascending thither, however brave he might be, could do so only by death. The mass of humanity had no pretensions to mount so high. Their religion gave them the choice between a perpetual abode in the tomb, or confinement in the prison of Alat. If at times they strove to escape from these alternatives, and to picture otherwise their condition in the world beyond, their ideas as to the other life continued to remain vague, and never approached the minute precision of the Egyptian conception. The cares of the present life were too absorbing to allow them leisure to speculate upon the conditions of a future existence. End of Part 27 Read by Professor Heather and Bye. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 28 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3 by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3 Chaldean Civilization, Part 1. The Chaldean kings, unlike their contemporaries the pharaohs, rarely put forward any pretensions to divinity. They contented themselves with occupying an intermediate position between their subjects and the gods, and for the purpose of mediation they believed themselves to be endowed with powers not possessed by ordinary mortals. They sometimes designated themselves the sons of Ea, or of Ninsun, or some other deity, but this involved no belief in a divine parentage, and was merely pious hyperbole, they entertained no illusions with regard to any descent from a god, or even from one of his doubles. But they desired to be recognized as his vicegerents here below, as his prophets, his well-beloved, his pastors, elected by him to rule his human flocks, or as priests devotedly attached to his service. While, however, the ordinary priest chose for himself a single master to whom he devoted himself, the priest-king exercised universal sacerdotal functions, and claimed to be pontiff of all the national religions. His choice, naturally, was directed by preference to the patrons of his city, those who had raised his ancestors from the dust, and had exalted him to the supreme rank. But there were other divinities who claimed their share of his homage, and expected of him a devotion suited to their importance. If he had attempted to carry out these duties personally in detail, he would have had to spend his whole life at the foot of the altar, even when he had delegated as many of them as he could to the regular clergy, there still remained sufficient to occupy a large part of his time. Every month, every day, brought its inevitable round of sacrifices, prayers, and processions. On the first of the second Illo, the king of Babylon had to present a gazelle without blemish to sin. He then made an offering of his own choosing to Shamash, and cut the throats of his victims before the god. These ceremonies were repeated on the second without any alteration, but from the third to the twelfth they took place during the night, before the statues of Merodach and Ishtar, in turn with those of Nebo and Tashmit, of Molil and Ninlil, of Aman and of Zirbanit, sometimes at the rising of a particular constellation, as, for instance, that of the great bear, or that of the sons of Ishtar. 
sometimes at the moment when the moon raised above the earth her luminous crown. On such a date a penitential psalm or a litany was to be recited. At another time it was forbidden to eat of meat, either cooked or smoked, to change the body linen, to wear white garments, to drink medicine, to sacrifice, to put forth an edict, or to drive out in a chariot. Not only at Babylon, but everywhere else, obedience to the religious rites weighed heavily on the local princes. At Uru, at Lagash, at Nippur, and in the ruling cities of Upper and Lower Chaldea. The king, as soon as he succeeded to the throne, repaired to the temple to receive his solemn investiture, which differed in form according to the gods he worshipped. At Babylon he addressed himself to the statue of Bel Merodach in the first days of the month Nisan, which followed his accession, and he took him by the hands to do homage to him. From thenceforth he officiated for Merodach here below and the scrupulously minute devotions, which daily occupied hours of his time, were so many acts of allegiance which his fealty as a vassal constrained him to perform to his suzerain. They were, in fact, analogous to the daily audiences demanded of a great lord by his steward, for the purpose of rendering his accounts and of informing him of current business. Any interruption not justified by a matter of supreme importance would be liable to be interpreted as a want of respect, or as revealing an inclination to rebel. By neglecting the slightest ceremonial detail the king would arouse the suspicions of the gods, and excite their anger against himself and his subjects. The people had, therefore, a direct interest in his careful fulfillment of the priestly functions, and his piety was not the least of his virtues in their eyes. All other virtues, bravery, equity, justice, depended on it, and were only valuable from the divine aid which piety obtained for them. The gods and heroes of the earliest ages had taken upon themselves the tasks of protecting the faithful from all their enemies, whether men or beasts. If a lion decimated their flocks, or a urus of gigantic size devastated their crops, it was the king's duty to follow the example of his fabulous predecessors, and to set out and overcome them. The enterprise demanded all the more courage and supernatural help, since these beasts were believed to be no mere ordinary animals, but were looked on as instruments of divine wrath, the cause of which was often unknown, and whoever assailed these monsters provoked not only them but the god who instigated them. Piety and confidence in the patron of the city alone sustained the king when he set forth to drive the animal back to its lair. He engaged in close combat with it, and no sooner had he pierced it with his arrows or his lance, or felled it with an axe and dagger, than he hastened to pour a libation upon it, and to dedicate it as a trophy in one of the temples. His exalted position entailed on him no less perils in time of war. If he did not personally direct the first attacking column, he placed himself at the head of the band composed of the follower of the army, whose charge at an opportune moment was wont to secure the victory. What would have been the use of his valor, if the dread of the gods had not preceded his march, and if the light of their countenances had not struck terror into the ranks of the enemy? As soon as he had triumphed by their command, he sought before all else to reward them amply for the assistance they had given him. He poured a tithe of the spoil into the coffers of their treasury. He made over a part of the conquered country to their domain. He granted them a tale of the prisoners to cultivate their lands or to work at their buildings. Even the idols of the vanquished shared the fate of their people. The king tore them from the sanctuaries which had hitherto sheltered them, and took them as prisoners in his train to form a court of captive gods about his patron divinity. Shamash, the great judge of heaven, inspired him with justice, and the prosperity which his good administration obtained for the people was less the work of the sovereign than that of the immortals. We know too little of the inner family life of the kings to attempt to say how they were able to combine the strict sacerdotal obligations incumbent on them with the routine of daily life. We merely observe that on great days of festival or sacrifice, when they themselves officiated, they laid aside all the insignia of royalty during the ceremony and were clad as ordinary priests. We see them on such occasions represented with short-cut hair and naked breast, the loincloth about their waist, advancing foremost in the rank, carrying the heavily laden kufa, or reed basket, as if they were ordinary slaves, and as a fact they had for the moment put aside their sovereignty and were merely temple servants, or slaves appearing before their divine master to do his bidding, and disguising themselves for the nonce in the garb of servitors. 
the wives of the sovereign do not seem to have been invested with the semi-sacred character which led the Egyptian women to be associated with the devotions of men, and made them indispensable auxiliaries in all religious ceremonies. They did not, moreover, occupy that important position side by side with the man which the Egyptian law assigned to the queens of the pharaohs. Whereas the monuments on the banks of the Nile reveal to us princesses sharing the throne of their husbands, whom they embrace with a gesture of frank affection, in Chaldea the wives of the prince, his mother, sisters, daughters, and even his slaves, remain invisible to posterity. The harem in which they were shut up by custom rarely opened its doors. The people seldom caught sight of them. Their relatives spoke of them as little as possible. Those in power avoided associating them in public acts of worship or government, and we could count on our fingers the number of those whom the inscriptions mentioned by name. Some of them were drawn from the noble families of the capital. Others came from the kingdoms of Chaldea or from foreign courts. A certain number never rose above the condition of mere concubines. Many assumed the title of queen, while almost all served as living pledges of allegiance made with rival states or had been given as hostages at the concluding of a peace on the termination of war. As the kings, who put forward no pretensions to divine origin, were not constrained, after the fashion of the pharaohs, to marry their sisters in order to keep up the purity of their race, it was rare to find one among their wives who possessed an equal right to the crown with themselves. Such a case could be found only in troublous times, when an aspirant to the throne, of base extraction, legitimated his usurpation by marrying a sister or daughter of his predecessor. The original status of the mother almost always determined that of her children, and the sons of a princess were born princes, even if their father were of obscure or unknown origin. These princes exercised important functions at court, or they received possessions which they administered under the suzerainty of the head of the family. The daughters were given to foreign kings, or to scions of the most distinguished families. The sovereign was under no obligation to hand down his crown to any particular member of his family. The eldest son usually succeeded him, but the king could, if he preferred, select his favorite child as his successor, even if he happened to be the youngest, or the only one born of a slave. As soon as the sovereign had made known his will, the custom of primogeniture was set aside, and his word became law. We can well imagine the secret intrigues formed by both mothers and sons to curry favor with the father and bias his choice. We can picture the jealousy with which they mutually watched each other, and the bitter hatred which any preference shown to one would arouse in the breasts of all the others. Often brothers, who had been disappointed in their expectations, would combine secretly against the chosen or supposed heir. A conspiracy would break out, and the people suddenly learned that their ruler of yesterday had died by the hand of an assassin, and that a new one filled his place." Sometimes discontent spread beyond the confines of the palace. The army became divided into two hostile camps. The citizens took the side of one or the other of the aspirants, and civil war raged for several years, till some decisive action brought it to a close. Meantime, tributary vassals took advantage of the consequent disorder to shake off the yoke. The Blamites and various neighboring cities joined in the dispute, and ranged themselves on the side of the party from which there was most to be gained the victorious faction always had to pay dearly for this somewhat dubious help, and came out impoverished from the struggle. Such an internecine war often caused the downfall of a dynasty, at times, indeed, that of the entire state. End of section 28. Read by Professor Heather Mbai. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 29 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 2. The palaces of the Chaldean kings, like those of the Egyptians, presented the appearance of an actual citadel. The walls had to be sufficiently thick to withstand an army for an indefinite period, and to protect the garrison from every emergency, except that of treason or famine. One of the statues found at Tello holds in its lap the plan of one of these residences. The external outline alone is given, but by means of it we can easily picture to ourselves a fortified place, with its towers, its forts, and its gateways placed between two bastions. It represents the ancient palace of Lagash. 
subsequently enlarged and altered by Ueda, or one of the vicegerents who succeeded him, in which many a great lord of the place must have resided down to the time of the Christian era. The site on which it was built in the Gursu quarter of the city was not entirely unoccupied at the time of its foundation. Urbau had raised a ziggurat on that very spot some centuries previously, and the walls which he had constructed were falling into ruin. Gudea did not destroy the work of his remote predecessor, he merely incorporated it into the substructure of the new building, thus showing an indifference similar to that evinced by the pharaohs for the monuments of a former dynasty. The palaces, like the temples, never rose directly from the soil, but were invariably built on the top of an artificial mound of crude brick. At Lagash, this solid platform rises to the height of forty feet above the plain, and the only means of access to the top is by a single narrow steep staircase, easily cut off or defended. The palace which surmounts this artificial eminence describes a sort of irregular rectangle, 174 feet long by 69 feet wide, and had, contrary to the custom in Egypt, the four angles oriented to the four cardinal points. The two principal sides are not parallel, but swell out slightly towards the middle, and the flexion of the lines almost follows the contour of one of those little clay cones upon which the kings were wont to inscribe their annals or dedications. This flexure was probably not intentional on the part of the architect, but was owing to the difficulty of keeping a wall of such a considerable extent on a straight line from one end to another, and all eastern nations, whether Chaldean or Egyptian, troubled themselves but little about correctness of alignment, since defects of this kind were scarcely ever perceptible on the actual edifice, and are only clearly revealed in the plan drawn out to scale with modern precision. The façade of the building faces southeast, and is divided into three blocks of unequal size. The centre of the middle block for a length of eighteen feet projects some three feet from the main front, and by directly facing the spectator, ingeniously masks the obtuse angle formed by the meeting of the two walls. This projection is flanked right and left by regular grooves, similar to those which ornament the facades of the fortresses and brick houses of the ancient empire in Egypt. The regular alternation of projections and hollows breaks the monotony of the facing by the play of light and shade. Beyond these, again, the wall surface is broken by semicircular pilasters some seventeen inches in diameter, without bases, capitals, or even a moulding, but placed side by side like so many tree trunks or posts forming a palisade. Various schemes of decoration succeed each other in progressive sequence, less ornate and at greater distances apart, the further they recede from the central block, and the nearer they approach to the extremities of the façade. They stop short at the southern angle, and the two sides of the edifice running from south to west, and again from west to north, are flat, bare surfaces, unbroken by projection or groove to relieve the poverty and monotony of their appearance. The decoration reappears on the northeast front, where the arrangement of the principal façade is partly reproduced. The groove divisions here start from the angles, and the engaged columns are wanting, or rather they are transferred to the central projection, and from a distance have the effect of a row of gigantic organ pipes. We may well ask if this squat and heavy mass of building, which must have attracted the eye from all parts of the town, had nothing to relieve the dull and dismal color of its component bricks. The idea might not have occurred to us had we not found elsewhere an attempt to lessen the gloomy appearance of the architecture by colored plastering. At Uruk, the walls of the palace are decorated by means of terracotta cones, fixed deep into the solid plaster and painted red, black, or yellow, forming interlaced or diaper patterns of chevrons, spirals, lozenges, and triangles, with a very fair result. This mosaic of colored plaster covered all the surfaces, both flat and curved, giving to the building a cheerful aspect entirely wanting in that of Lagash. A long, narrow trough of yellowish limestone stood in front of the palace, and was raised on two steps. It was carved in relief on the outside with figures of women standing with outstretched hands, passing to each other vases from which gushed forth two streams of water. This trough formed a reservoir, which was filled every morning for the use of the men and beasts, and those whom some business or a command brought to the palace could refresh themselves there while waiting to be received by the master. The gates which gave access to the interior were placed at somewhat irregular intervals. Two opened from the principal façade, but on each of the other sides there was only one entrance. 
They were arched, and so low that admittance was not easily gained. They were closed with two-leaved doors of cedar or cypress, provided with bronze hinges, which turned upon two blackish stones firmly set in the masonry, on either side, and usually inscribed with the name of the founder or that of the reigning sovereign. Two of the entrances possessed a sort of covered way, in which the soldiers of the external watch could take shelter from the heat of the sun by day, from the cold at night, and from the dews at dawn. On crossing the threshold, a corridor, flanked with two small rooms for porters or warders, led into a courtyard surrounded with buildings of sufficient depth to take up nearly half of the area enclosed within the walls. This court was moreover a semi-public place, to which tradesmen, merchants, suppliants, and functionaries of all ranks had easy access. A suite of three rooms shut off in the northeast angle did duty for a magazine or arsenal. The southern portion of the building was occupied by the state apartments, the largest of which measures only forty feet in length. In these rooms Gudea and his successors gave audience to their nobles and administered justice. The administrative officers and the staff who had charge of them were probably located in the remaining part of the building. The roof was flat, and ran all round the enclosing wall, forming a terrace, access to it being gained by a staircase built between the principal entrance and the arsenal. At the northern angle rose a ziggurat. Custom demanded that the sovereign should possess a temple within his dwelling, where he could fulfill his religious duties without going into the town and mixing with the crowd. At Lagash the sacred tower was of an older date than the palace, and possibly formed a part of the ancient building of Urbal. It was originally composed of three stories, but the lower one was altered by Gudea, and disappeared entirely in the thickness of the basal platform. The second story thus became the bottom one. It was enlarged, slightly raised above the neighboring roofs, and was probably crowned by a sanctuary dedicated to Ningirsu. It was indeed a monument of modest proportions, and most of the public temples soared far above it. But small as it was, the whole town might be seen from the summit, with its separate quarters and its belt of gardens, and beyond, the open country intersected with streams, studded with isolated villages, patches of wood, pools and weedy marshes left by the retiring inundation, and in the far distance the lines of trees and bushes which bordered the banks of the Euphrates and its confluence. Should a troop of enemies venture within range of sight, or should a suspicious tumult arise within the city, the watchers posted on the highest terrace would immediately give the alarm, and through their warning the king would have time to close his gates, and take measures to resist the invading enemy or crush the revolt of his subjects. The northern apartments of the palace were appropriated to Gudea and his family. They were placed with their back to the entrance court, and were divided into two groups. The sovereign, his male children, and their attendants inhabited the western one, while the women and their slaves were cloistered, so to speak, in the northern set. The royal dwelling had an external exit by means of a passage issuing on the northwest of the enclosure, and it also communicated with the great courtyard by a vaulted corridor, which ran along one side of the base of the ziggurat. The doors which closed these two entrances opened wide enough to admit only one person at a time, and to the right and left were recesses in the wall, which enabled the guards to examine all comers unobserved and stabbed them promptly if there were anything suspicious in their behavior. Eight chambers were lighted from the courtyard. In one of them were kept all the provisions for the day, while another served as a kitchen. The head cook carried on his work at a sort of rectangular dresser of moderate size, on which several fireplaces were marked out by little dividing walls of burnt bricks, to accommodate as many pots or pans of various sizes. A well sunk in the corner right down below the substructure provided the water needed for culinary purposes. The king and his belongings accommodated themselves in the remaining five or six rooms as best they could. A corridor, guarded as carefully as the one previously described, led to his private apartments and to those of his wives. These comprised a yard, some half-dozen cells varying in size, a kitchen, a well, and a door through which the servants could come and go, without passing through the men's quarters. The whole description in no way corresponds with the marvellous ideal of an oriental palace, which we form for ourselves. The apartments are mean and dismal, imperfectly lighted by the door or by some small aperture timidly cut in the ceiling, arranged so as to protect the inmates from the heat and dust, but without a thought given to luxury or display. 
the walls were entirely void of any cedar woodwork inlaid with gold, or panels of mosaic such as we find in the temples, nor were they hung with dyed or embroidered draperies such as we moderns love to imagine, and which we spread out in profusion, when we attempt to reproduce the interior of an ancient house or palace. End of chapter 29. Read by Professor Heather and by. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 30 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 3. The walls had to remain bare for the sake of coolness. At the most they were only covered with a coat of white plaster, on which were painted, in one or two colors, some scene of civil or religious life, or troops of fantastic monsters struggling with one another, or men each with a bird seated on his wrist. The furniture was not less scanty than the decoration. There were mats on the ground, coffers in which were kept the linen and wearing apparel, low beds inlaid with ivory and metal and provided with coverings and a thin mattress, copper or wooden stands to support lamps or vases, square stools on four legs united by crossbars, armchairs with lion's claw feet, resembling the Egyptian armchairs in outline, and making us ask if they were brought into Chaldea by caravans, or made from models which had come from some other country. A few rare objects of artistic character might be found, which bore witness to a certain taste for elegance and refinement, as, for instance, a kind of circular trough of black stone, probably used to support a vase. Three rows of imbricated scales surrounded the base of this, while seven small sitting figures leaned back against the upper part with an air of satisfaction, which is most cleverly rendered. The decoration of the larger chambers used for public receptions and official ceremonies, while never assuming the monumental character which we observe in contemporary Egyptian buildings, afforded more scope for richness and variety than was offered by the living rooms. Small tablets of brownish limestone, let into the wall or affixed to its service by terracotta pegs, and decorated with inscriptions, represented in a more or less artless fashion the figure of the sovereign officiating before some divinity, while his children and servants took part in the ceremony by their chanting. Inscribed bricks celebrating the king's exploits were placed here and there in conspicuous places. These were not embedded like the others in two layers of bitumen or lime, but were placed in full view upon bronze statues of divinities or priests, fixed into the ground or into some part of the masonry, as magical nails destined to preserve the bricks from destruction, and consequently to keep the memory of the dedicator continually before posterity. Stella, engraved on both sides, recalled the wars of past times, the battlefield, the scenes of horror which took place there, and the return of the victor and his triumph. Sitting or standing figures of diorite, siliceous sandstone or hard limestone, bearing inscriptions on their robes or shoulders, perpetuated the features of the founder or members of his family, and commemorated the pious donations which had obtained for him the favor of the gods. The palace of Lagash contained dozens of such statues, several of which have come down to us almost intact, one of the ancient Urbao and nine of Gudea. To judge by the space covered and the arrangement of the rooms, the vicegerents of Lagash and the chiefs of towns of minor importance must, as a rule, have been content with a comparatively small number of servants. Their court probably resembled that of the Egyptian barons, who lived much about the same period, such as Khnumhotpu of the Nome of the Gazelle, or Thottotpu of Hermopolis. In great cities such as Babylon the palace occupied a much larger area, and the crowd of courtiers was doubtless as great as that which thronged about the pharaohs. No exact enumeration of them has come down to us, but the titles which we come across show with what minuteness they defined the offices about the person of the sovereign. His costume alone required almost as many persons as there were garments. The men wore the light loin-cloth or short-sleeved tunic which scarcely covered the knees. After the fashion of the Egyptians, they threw over the loin-cloth and the tunic a large abaya, whose shape and material varied with the caprice of fashion. They often chose for this purpose a sort of shawl of a plain material, fringed or ornamented with a flat stripe round the edge. Often they seem to have preferred it ribbed, or artificially kilted from top to bottom. 
The favorite material in ancient times, however, seems to have been a hairy, shaggy cloth or woolen stuff, whose close, fleecy thread hung sometimes straight, sometimes crimped or waved, in regular rows like flounces one above another. This could be arranged squarely around the neck like a mantle, but was more often draped crosswise over the left shoulder and brought under the right armpit, so as to leave the upper part of the breast and the arm bare on that side. It made a convenient and useful garment, an excellent protection in summer from the sun, and from the icy north wind in the winter. The feet were shod with sandals, a tight-fitting cap covered the head, and round it was rolled a thick strip of linen, forming a sort of rudimentary turban which completed the costume. It is questionable whether, as in Egypt, wigs and false beards formed part of the toilette. On some monuments we notice smooth faces and close-cropped heads. On others the men appear with long hair, either falling loose or twisted into a knot on the back of the neck. While the Egyptians delighted in garments of thin white linen, but slightly plaited or crimped, the dwellers on the banks of the Euphrates preferred thick and heavy stuffs patterned and striped with many colors. The kings wore the same costume as their subjects, but composed of richer and finer materials, dyed red or blue, decorated with floral, animal, or geometrical designs. A high, tower-shaped tiara covered the forehead, unless replaced by a diadem of sin or some of the other gods, which was a conical mitre supporting a double pair of horns, and sometimes surmounted by a sort of diadem of feathers and mysterious figures, embroidered or painted on the cap. Their arms were loaded with massive bracelets and their fingers with rings. They wore necklaces and earrings, and carried each a dagger in the belt. The royal wardrobe, jewels, arms, and insignia formed so many distinct departments, and each was further divided into minor sections for body linen, washing, or for this or that kind of headdress or scepter. The dress of the women, which was singularly like that of the men, required no less a staff of attendants. The female servants, as well as the male, went about bare to the waist, at all events while working indoors. When they went out, they wore the same sort of tunic or loincloth, but longer and more resembling a petticoat, they had the same abaya drawn round the shoulders or rolled about the body like a cloak, but with the women it nearly touched the ground. Sometimes an actual dress seems to have been substituted for the abaya, drawn into the figure by a belt and cut out of the same hairy material as that of which the mantles were made. The boots were of soft leather, laced and without heels. The women's ornaments were more numerous than those of the men, and comprised necklaces, bracelets, ankle, finger, and earrings, their hair was separated into bands and kept in place on the forehead by a fillet, falling in thick plates or twisted into a coil on the nape of the neck. A great deal of the work was performed by foreign or native slaves, generally under the command of eunuchs, to whom the king and royal princes entrusted most of the superintendents of their domestic arrangements. They guarded and looked after the sleeping apartments, they fanned and kept the flies from their master, and handed him his food and drink. Eunuchs in Egypt were either unknown or but little esteemed. They never seemed to have been used, even in times when relations with Asia were of daily occurrence, and when they might have been supplied from the Babylonian slave markets. End of section 30. Read by Professor Heather and by. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 31 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 4. All these various officials, closely attached to the person of the sovereign, heads of the wardrobe, chamberlains, cup-bearers, bearers of the royal sword or of the flabella, commanders of the eunuchs or of the guards, had, by the nature of their duties, daily opportunities of gaining a direct influence over their master and his government, and from among them he often chose the generals of his army or the administrators of his domains. Here again, as far as the few monuments and the obscurity of the text permit of our judging, we find indications of a civil and military organization analogous to that of Egypt. The divergencies which contemporaries may have been able to detect in the two national systems are effaced by the distance of time, and we are struck merely by the resemblances. As all business transactions were carried on by barter or by the exchange of merchandise for weighed quantities of the precious metals, 
the taxes were consequently paid in kind, the principal media being corn and other cereals, dates, fruits, stuffs, live animals and slaves, as well as gold, silver, lead, and copper, either in its native state or melted into bars fashioned into implements or ornamented vases. Hence we continually come across fiscal storehouses, both in town and country, which demanded the services of a whole troop of functionaries and workmen, administrators of corn, cattle, precious metals, wine, and oil. In fact, as many administrators as there were cultures or industries in the country presided over the gathering of the products into the central depots and regulated their redistribution. A certain portion was reserved for the salaries of the employees and the pay of the workmen engaged in executing public works. The surplus accumulated in the treasury and formed a reserve, which was not drawn upon except in cases of extreme necessity. Every palace, in addition to its living rooms, contained within its walls large store chambers filled with provisions and weapons, which made it more or less a fortress, furnished with indispensable requisites for sustaining a prolonged siege, either against an enemy's troops or the king's own subjects in revolt. The king always kept about him bodies of soldiers who perhaps were foreign mercenaries, like the Mazai'u of the armies of the pharaohs, and who formed his permanent bodyguard in times of peace. When a war was eminent, a military levy was made upon his domains, but we are unable to find out whether the recruits thus raised were drawn indiscriminately from the population in general, or merely from a special class, analogous to that of the warriors which we find in Egypt, who were paid in the same way by grants of land. The equipment of these soldiers was of the rudest kind. They had no cuirass, but carried a rectangular shield, and in the case of those of higher rank at all events, a conical metal helmet, probably of beaten copper, provided with a piece to protect the back of the neck. The heavy infantry were armed with a pike tipped with bronze ox-copper, an axe or sharp adze, a stone-headed mace, and a dagger. The light troops were provided only with the bow and sling. As early as the third millennium B.C., the king went to battle in a chariot drawn by onagers, or perhaps horses. He had his own peculiar weapon, which was a curved baton, probably terminating in a metal point, and resembling the scepter of the pharaohs. Considerable quantities of all these arms were stored in the arsenals, which contained depots for bows, maces, and pikes, and even the stones needed for the slings had their special department for storage. At the beginning of each campaign, a distribution of weapons to the newly levied troops took place, but as soon as the war was at an end, the men brought back their accoutrements, which were stored till they were again required. The valor of the soldiers and their chiefs was then rewarded. The share of the spoil for some consisted of cattle, gold, corn, a female slave, and vessels of value. For others, lands or towns in the conquered country, regulated by the rank of the recipients or the extent of the services they had rendered. Property thus given was hereditary, and privileges were often added to it which raised the holder to the rank of a petty prince. For instance, no royal official was permitted to impose a tax upon such lands, or take the cattle off them, or levy provisions upon them. No troop of soldiers might enter them, not even for the purpose of arresting a fugitive. Most of the noble families possessed domains of this kind, and constituted in each kingdom a powerful and wealthy feudal aristocracy, whose relations to their sovereign were probably much the same as those which bound the nomarchs to the pharaoh. The position of these nobles was not more stable than that of the dynasties under which they lived, while some among them gained power by marriages or by continued acquisitions of land, others fell into disgrace and were ruined. As the soil belonged to the gods, it is possible that these nobles were supposed, in theory, to depend upon the gods, but as the kings were the vicegerents of the gods upon earth, it was to the king, as a matter of fact, that they owed their elevation. Every state, therefore, comprised two parts, each subject to a distinct regime, one being the personal domain of the suzerain, which he managed himself, and from which he drew the revenues, the other was composed of fiefs, whose lords paid tribute and owed certain obligations to the king, the nature of which we are as yet unable to define. The Chaldean, like the Egyptian scribe, was the pivot on which the machinery of this double royal and seigneurial administration turned. He does not appear to have enjoyed as much consideration as his fellow official in the Nile Valley. The Chaldean princes, 
nobles, priests, soldiers, and temple or royal officials did not covet the title of scribe, or pride themselves upon holding that office side by side with their other dignities, as we see was the case with their Egyptian contemporaries. The position of a scribe, nevertheless, was an important one. We continually meet with it in all grades of society, in the palace, in the temples, in the storehouses, in private dwellings. In fact, the scribe was ubiquitous at court, in the town, in the country, in the army, managing affairs both small and great, and seeing that they were carried on regularly. His education differed but little from that given to the Egyptian scribe. He learned the routine of administrative or judicial affairs, the formularies for correspondence either with nobles or with ordinary people, the art of writing, of calculating quickly, and of making out bills correctly. We may well ask whether he ever employed papyrus or prepared skins for these purposes. It would indeed seem strange that, after centuries of intercourse, no caravan should have brought into Chaldea any of those materials which were in such constant use for literary purposes in Africa. Yet the same clay which furnished the architect with such an abundant building material appears to have been the only medium for transmitting the language which the scribes possessed. They were always provided with slabs of a fine plastic clay, carefully mixed and kept sufficiently moist to take easily the impression of an object, but at the same time sufficiently firm to prevent the marks once made from becoming either blurred or effaced. When a scribe had a text to copy or a document to draw up, he chose one out of his slabs, which he placed flat upon his left palm, and taking in the right a triangular stylus of flint, copper, bronze, or bone, he at once set to work. The instrument, in early times, terminated in a fine point, and the marks made by it when it was gently pressed upon the clay were slender and of uniform thickness. In later times the extremity of the stylus was cut with a bevel, and the impression then took the shape of a metal nail or a wedge. They wrote from left to right along the upper part of the tablet, and covered both sides of it with closely written lines, which sometimes ran over onto the edges. When the writing was finished, the scribe sent his work to the potter, who put it in the kiln and baked it, or the writer may have had a small oven at his own disposition, as a clerk with us would have his table or desk. The shape of these documents varied, and sometimes strikes us as being peculiar. Besides the tablets and the bricks, we find small solid cones, or hollow cylinders of considerable size, on which the kings related their exploits or recorded the history of their wars, or the dedication of their buildings. This method had a few inconveniences but many advantages. These clay books were heavy to hold and clumsy to handle, while the characters did not stand out well from the brown, yellow, and whitish background of the material. But on the other hand, a poem, baked and incorporated into the page itself, ran less danger of destruction than if scribbled in ink on sheets of papyrus. Fire could make no impression on it. It could withstand water for a considerable length of time, even if broken, the pieces were still of use. As long as it was not pulverized, the entire document could be restored, with the exception, perhaps, of a few signs, or some scraps of a sentence. The inscriptions which have been saved from the foundations of the most ancient temples, several of which date back forty or fifty centuries, are, for the most part, as clear and legible as when they left the hands of the writer who engraved them, or of the workmen who baked them. It is owing to the material to which they were committed that we possess the principal works of Chaldean literature which have come down to us, poems, annals, hymns, magical incantations. How few fragments of these would ever have reached us had their authors confided them to parchment or paper, after the manner of the Egyptian scribes. The greatest danger that they ran was that of being left forgotten in a corner of the chamber in which they had been kept, or buried under the rubbish of a building after a fire or some violent catastrophe. Even then the debris were the means of preserving them, by falling over them and covering them up. Protected under the ruins, they would lie there for centuries, till the fortunate explorer should bring them to light and deliver them over to the patient study of the learned. The cuneiform character in itself is neither picturesque nor decorative. It does not offer that delightful assemblage of birds and snakes, of men and quadrupeds, of heads and limbs, of tools, weapons, stars, trees, and boats, which succeed each other in perplexing order on the Egyptian monuments, to give permanence to the glory of Pharaoh and the greatness of his gods. Cuneiform writing is essentially composed of thin, short lines, 
placed in juxtaposition, or crossing each other in a somewhat clumsy fashion. It has the appearance of numbers of nails scattered about haphazard, and its angular configuration, and its stiff and spiny appearance, gives the inscriptions a dull and forbidding aspect, which no artifice of the engraver can overcome. End of section 31. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 32 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 5. Yet in spite of their seemingly arbitrary character, this mass of strokes had its source in actual hieroglyphics. As in the origin of the Egyptian script, the earliest writers had begun by drawing on stone or clay the outline of the object of which they desired to convey the idea. But whereas in Egypt the artistic temperament of the race, and the increasing skill of the sculptors, had by decrees brought the drawing of each sign to such perfection that it became a miniature portrait of the being or object to be reproduced, in Chaldea, on the contrary, the signs became degraded from their original forms on account of the difficulty experienced in copying them with the stylus on the clay tablets. They lost their original vertical position, and were placed horizontally, retaining finally but the very faintest resemblance to the original model. For instance, the Chaldean conception of the sky was that of a vault divided into eight segments by diameters running from the four cardinal points, and from their principal subdivisions. The external circle was soon omitted, the transverse line alone remaining, which again was simplified into a kind of irregular cross. The figure of a man standing, indicated by the lines resembling his contour, was placed on its side, and reduced little by little till it came to be merely a series of ill-balanced lines. We may still recognize in it the five fingers and palm of a human hand, but who would guess at the first glance that one of them stands for the foot which the scribes strove to place beside each character the special hieroglyph from which it had been derived? Several fragments of these still exist a study of which seems to show that the Assyrian scribes of a more recent period were at times as much puzzled as we are ourselves when they strove to get at the principles of their own script. They had come to look on it as nothing more than a system of arbitrary combinations, whose original form had passed all the more readily into oblivion, because it had been borrowed from a foreign race, who, as far as they were concerned, had ceased to have a separate existence. The script had been invented by the Sumerians in the very earliest times, and even they may have brought it in an elemental condition from their distant fatherland. The first articulate sounds which, being attached to the hieroglyphs, gave to each an unalterable pronunciation, were words in the Sumerian tongue. Subsequently, when the natural progress of human thought led the Chaldeans to replace, as in Egypt, the majority of the signs representing ideas by those representing sounds, the syllabic values which were developed side by side with the ideographic values were purely Sumerian. One symbol, throughout all its forms, designates in the first place the sky, then the god of the sky, and finally the concept of divinity in general. In its first two senses it is read Anna, but in the last it becomes Dingir, Dimir, and though it never lost its double force, it was soon separated from the ideas which it evoked to be used merely to denote all the syllable an wherever it occurred, even in cases where it had no connection with the sky or heavenly things. The same process was applied to other signs with similar results. After having merely denoted ideas, they came to stand for the sounds corresponding to them, and then passed on to be mere syllables, complex syllables in which several consonants may be distinguished, or simple syllables composed of only one consonant and one vowel, or vice versa. The Egyptians had carried this system still further, and in many cases had kept only one part of the syllable, namely, a mute consonant. They detached, for example, the final u from pu and bu, and gave only the values b and p to the human leg j and the mat q. The peoples of the Euphrates stopped halfway, and admitted actual letters for the vowel sounds a, i, and u only. Their system remained a syllabary interspaced with ideograms, but excluded an alphabet. It was eminently wanting in simplicity, 
but taken as a whole it would not have presented as many difficulties as the script of the Egyptians, had it not been forced, at a very early period, to adapt itself to the exigencies of a language for which it had not been made. When it came to be appropriated by the Semites, the ideographs, which up till then had been read in Sumerian, did not lose the sounds which they possessed in that tongue, but borrowed others from the new language. For example, God was called Ilu, and Heaven called Shami. When encountered in inscriptions by the Semites, were read Ilu when the context showed the sense to be God, and Shami when the character evidently meant Heaven. They added these two vocables to the preceding Ana, An, Dinger, Dimmer, but they did not stop there. They confounded the picture of the star with that of the sky, and sometimes attributed to it the pronunciation kakabu, and the meaning of star. The same process was applied to all the groups, and the Semitic values being added to the Sumerian, the scribes soon found themselves in possession of a double set of syllables, both simple and compound. This multiplicity of sounds, this polyphonous character attached to their signs, became a cause of embarrassment even to them. For instance, one symbol, when found in the body of a word, stood for the syllables high or hot, mid, mit, till, or ziz. As an ideogram, it was used for a score of different concepts, that of lord or master, inu, bilu, that of blood, damu, for a corpse, pagru, shalamtu, for the feeble or oppressed, katu, nagpu, as the hollow and the spring, nakbu, for the state of old age, labaru, of dying, matu, of killing, mitu, of opening, pitu, besides other meanings. Several phonetic complements were added to it. It was preceded by ideograms which determined the sense in which it was to be read, but which, like the Egyptian determinatives, were not pronounced, and in this manner they succeeded in limiting the number of mistakes which it was possible to make. With a final symbol it would always mean Bilu, the master, but with an initial symbol it denoted the gods Bel or Ea. With a symbol which indicated a man it would be the corpse, Pagru and Shalamtu. With the symbol prefixed it meant Matanu, the plague or death, and so on. In spite of these restrictions and explanations, the obscurity of the meaning was so great that in many cases the scribes ran the risk of being unable to make out certain words and understand certain passages. Many of the values occurred but rarely and remained unknown to those who did not take the trouble to make a careful study of the syllabary in its history. It became necessary to draw up tables for their use, in which all the signs were classified and arranged, with their meanings and phonetic transcriptions. These signs occupied one column, and in three or four corresponding columns would be found first, the name assigned to it, secondly, the spelling, in syllables, of the phonetic values which the signs expressed, thirdly, the Sumerian and Assyrian words which they served to render, and sometimes glosses which completed the explanation. Even this is far from exhausting the matter. Several of these dictionaries went back to a very early date, and tradition ascribes to Sargon of Agade the merit of having them drawn up, or of having collected them in his palace. The number of them naturally increased in the course of centuries. In the later times of the Assyrian Empire they were so numerous as to form nearly one-fourth of the works in the library at Nineveh under Assurbanipal. Other tablets contained dictionaries of archaic or obsolete terms, grammatical paradigms, extracts from law or ancient hymns analyzed sentence by sentence, and often word by word, interlinear glosses, collections of Sumerian formulas translated into Semitic speech, a child's guide, in fact, which the savants of those times consulted with as much advantage as those of our own day have done, and which must have saved them from many a blunder. When once accustomed to the difficulties and intricacies of their calling, the scribes were never at a standstill. The stylus was plied in Chaldea no less assiduously than was the calamus in Egypt, and the indestructible clay, which the Chaldeans were as a rule content to use, proved a better medium in the long run than the more refined material employed by their rivals. The baked or merely dried clay tablets have withstood the assaults of time in surprising quantities, while the majority of papyri have disappeared without leaving a trace behind. If at Babylon we rarely meet with those representations, which we find everywhere in the tombs of Saqqara or Giza, of the people themselves and their families, their occupations, amusements, and daily intercourse, we possess, on the other hand, 
that of which the ruins of Memphis have furnished us but scanty instances up to the present time, namely, judicial documents, regulating the mutual relations of the people, and conferring a legal sanction on the various events of their lives. Whether it were a question of buying lands or contracting a marriage, of a loan on interest or the sale of slaves, the scribe was called in with his soft tablets to engross the necessary agreement. In this he would insert as many details as possible, the day of the month, the year of the reigning sovereign, and at times, to be still more precise, an allusion to some important event which had just taken place, and a memorial of which was inserted in official annals, such as the taking of a town, the defeat of a neighboring king, the dedication of a temple, the building of a wall or fortress, the opening of a canal, or the ravages of an inundation. The names of the witnesses and magistrates before whom the act was confirmed were also added to those of the contracting parties. The method of sanctioning it was curious. An indentation was made with a fingernail on one of the sides of the tablet, and this mark, followed or preceded by the mention of a name, Nail of Zabudamik, Nail of Abzi, took the place of our more or less complicated sign manuals. In later times, only the buyer and witnesses approved by a nail mark, while the seller appended his seal, an inscription incised above the impress indicating the position of the signatory. Every one of any importance possessed a seal, which he wore attached to his wrist or hung round his neck by a cord. He scarcely ever allowed it to be separated from his person during his lifetime, and after death it was placed with him in the tomb in order to prevent any improper use being made of it. It was usually a cylinder, sometimes a truncated cone with a convex base, either of marble, red or green jasper, agate, cornelian, onyx or rock crystal, but rarely of metal. Engraved upon it in intaglio was an emblem or subject chosen by the owner, such as a single figure of a god or goddess, an act of adoration, a sacrifice, or an episode in the story of Gilgamesh, followed sometimes by the inscription of a name and title. The cylinder was rolled, or in the case of the cone, merely pressed on the clay, in the space reserved for it. In several localities the contracting parties had recourse to a very ingenious procedure to prevent the agreements being altered or added to by unscrupulous persons. When the document had been impressed on the tablet, it was enveloped in a second coating of clay, upon which an exact copy of the original was made, the latter thus becoming inaccessible to forgers. If by chance, in course of time, any disagreement should take place, and an alteration of the visible text should be suspected, the outer envelope was broken in the presence of witnesses, and a comparison was made to see if the exterior corresponded exactly with the interior version. Families thus had their private archives, to which additions were rapidly made by every generation. Every household thus accumulated not only the evidences of its own history, but, to some extent, that of other families with whom they had formed alliances, or had business or friendly relations. End of section 32. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 33 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3 by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3 Chaldean Civilization, Part 6. The constitution of the family was of a complex character. It would appear that the people of each city were divided into clans, all of whose members claimed to be descended from a common ancestor, who had flourished at a more or less remote period. The members of each clan were by no means all in the same social position, some having gone down in the world, others having raised themselves, and amongst them we find many different callings, from agricultural laborers to scribes, and from merchants to artisans. No mutual tie existed among the majority of these members except the remembrance of their common origin, perhaps also a common religion, and eventual rights of succession or claims upon what belonged to each one individually. The branches which had become gradually separated from the parent stock, and which taken altogether formed the clan, possessed each, on the contrary, a very strict organization. It is possible that, at the outset, the woman occupied the more important position, but at an early date the man became the head of the family, and around him were ranged the wives, children, servants, and slaves, all of whom had their various duties and privileges. 
He offered the household worship to the gods of his race, in accordance with special rites which had come down to him from his father. He made at the tombs of his ancestors, at such times as were customary, the offerings and prayers which assured their repose in the other world, and his powers were as extensive in civil as in religious matters. He had absolute authority over all the members of his household, and anything undertaken by them without his consent was held invalid in the eyes of the law. His sons could not marry unless he had duly authorized them to do so. For this purpose he appeared before the magistrate with the future couple, and the projected union could not be held as an actual marriage, until he had affixed his seal or made his nail-mark on the contract tablet. It amounted, in fact, to a formal deed of sale, and the parents of the girl parted with her only in exchange for a proportionate gift from the bridegroom. One girl would be valued at a silver shekel by weight, while another was worth a mina, another much less. The handing over of the price was accompanied with a solemn solemnity. When the young man possessed no property, as yet, of his own, his family advanced him the sum needed for the purchase. On her side, the maiden did not enter upon her new life empty-handed. Her father, or in the case of his death, the head of the family at the time being, provided her with a dowry suited to her social position, which was often augmented considerably by presents from her grandmother, aunts, and cousins. The dowry would consist of a carefully marked-out field of corn, a grove of date-palms, a house in the town, a trousseau, furniture, slaves, or ready money, of which there would be three copies at least, two being given by the scribe to the contracting parties, while the third would be deposited in the hands of the magistrate. When the bride and bridegroom both belonged to the same class, or were possessed of equal fortunes, the relatives of the woman could extract an oath from the man that he would abstain from taking a second wife during her lifetime. A special article of the marriage agreement permitted the woman to go free, should the husband break his faith, and bound him to pay an indemnity as a compensation for the insult he had offered her. This engagement on the part of the man, however, did not affect his relations with his female servants. In Chaldea, as in Egypt, and indeed in the whole of the ancient world, they were always completely at the mercy of their purchaser, and the permission to treat them as he would had become so much of a custom that the begetting of children by their master was desired rather than otherwise. The complaints of the despised slave, who had not been taken into her master's favor, formed one of the themes of popular poetry at a very early period. When the contract tablet was finally sealed, one of the witnesses, who was required to be a free man, joined the hands of the young couple. Nothing then remained to be done but to invite the blessing of the gods, and to end the day by a feast, which would unite both families and their guests. The evil spirits, however, always in quest of an easy prey, were liable to find their way into the nuptial chamber, favoured by the confusion inseparable from all household rejoicing. Prudence demanded that their attempts should be frustrated, and that the newly married couple should be protected from their attacks. The companions of the bridegroom took possession of him, and hand to hand and foot to foot, formed as it were a rampart round him with their bodies, and carried him off solemnly to his expectant bride. He then again repeated the words which he had said in the morning, I am the son of a prince, gold and silver shall fill thy bosom, thou even thou shalt be my wife, I myself will be thy husband. And he continued, As the fruits borne by an orchard, so great shall be the abundance which I shall pour out upon this woman. The priest then called down upon him benedictions from on high. Therefore, O ye gods, all that is bad and all that is not good in this man, drive it far from him and give him strength. As for thee, O man, exhibit thy manhood, that this woman may be thy wife. Thou, O woman, give that which makes thy womanhood, that this man may be thy husband. On the following morning a thanksgiving sacrifice celebrated the completion of the marriage, and by purifying the new household drove from it the host of evil spirits. The woman, once bound, could only escape from the sovereign power of her husband by death or divorce but divorce for her was rather a trial to which she submitted than a right of which she could freely make use. Her husband could repudiate her at will without any complicated ceremonies. It was enough for him to say, Thou art not my wife, and to restore to her a sum of money equaling in value the dowry he had received from her. He then sent her back to her father, with a letter informing him of the dissolution of the conjugal tie. But if in a moment of weariness or anger she hurled the fatal formula at him, Thou art not my husband, her fate was sealed. She was thrown into the river and drowned. 
The adulteress was also punished with death, but with death by the sword, and when the use of iron became widespread, the blade was to be of that metal. Another ancient custom only spared the criminal to devote her to a life of infamy. The outraged husband stripped her of her fleecy garments, giving her merely the loincloth in its place, which left her half naked, and then turned her out of the house into the street, where she was at the mercy of the first passer-by. Women of noble or wealthy families found in their fortune a certain protection from the abuse of marital authority. The property which they brought with them by their marriage contract remained at their own disposal. They had the entire management of it, they farmed it out, they sold it, they spent the income from it as they liked, without interference from any one. The man enjoyed the comforts which it procured, but he could not touch it, and his hold upon it was so slight that his creditors could not lay their hands on it. If by his own act he divorced his wife, he not only lost all benefit from her property, but he was obliged to make her an allowance or to pay her an indemnity. At his death, the widow succeeded to these, without prejudice to what she was entitled by her marriage contract or the will of the deceased. The woman with a dowry, therefore, became more or less emancipated by virtue of her money. As her departure deprived the household of as much as, and sometimes more than, she had brought into it, every care was taken that she should have no cause to retire from it, and that no pretext should be given to her parents for her recall to her old home. Her wealth thus obtained for her the consideration and fair treatment which the law had, at the outset, denied to her. When, however, the wife was poor, she had to bear without complaint the whole burden of her inferior position. Her parents had no other resource than to ask the highest possible price for her, according to the rank in which they lived, or in virtue of the personal qualities she was supposed to possess, and this amount, paid into their hands when they delivered her over to the husband, formed, if not an actual dowry for her, at least a provision for her in case of repudiation or widowhood. She was not, however, any less the slave of her husband, a privileged slave, it is true, and one whom he could not sell like his other slaves, but of whom he could easily rid himself when her first youth was past, or when she ceased to please him. End of section 33. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 34 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 7. In many cases the fiction of purchase was set aside, and mutual consent took the place of all other formalities, marriage then becoming merely cohabitation, terminating at will. The consent of the father was not required for this irregular union, and many a son contracted a marriage after this fashion, unknown to his relatives, with some young girl, either in his own or in an inferior station. But the law refused to allow her any title except that of concubine, and forced her to wear a distinctive mark, perhaps that of servitude, namely, the representation of an olive in some valuable stone or in terracotta, bearing her own and her husband's name, with the date of their union, which she kept hung round her neck by a cord. Whether they were legitimate wives or not, the women of the lower and middle classes enjoyed as much independence as did the Egyptian women of a similar rank. As all the household cares fell to their share, it was necessary that they should be free to go about at all hours of the day, and they could be seen in the streets and the markets, with bare feet, their head and face uncovered, wearing their linen loincloth or their long draped garment of hairy texture. Their whole life was expended in a ceaseless toil for their husbands and children, Night and morning they went to fetch water from the public well or the river, they bruised the corn, made the bread, spun, wove, and clothed the entire household in spite of the frequent demands of maternity. The Chaldean women of wealth or noble birth, whose civil status gave them a higher position, did not enjoy so much freedom. They were scarcely affected by the cares of daily life, and if they did any work within their houses, it was more from a natural instinct, a sense of duty, or to relieve the tedium of their existence, than from constraint or necessity, but the exigencies of their rank reduced them to the state of prisoners. All the luxuries and comforts which money could procure were lavished on them, or they obtained them for themselves, but all the while they were obliged to remain shut in the harem within their own houses. When they went out, it was only to visit their female friends or their relatives, to go to some temple or festival, 
and on such occasions they were surrounded with servants, eunuchs, and pages, whose serried ranks shut out the external world. There was no lack of children in these houses when the man had several mistresses, either simultaneously or successively. Maternity was before all things a woman's first duty. Should she delay in bearing children, or should anything happen to them, she was considered as accursed or possessed, and she was banished from the family lest her presence should be a source of danger to it. In spite of this many households remained childless, either because a clause inserted in the contract prevented the dismissal of the wife if barren, or because the children had died when the father was stricken in years, and there was little hope of further offspring. In such places adoption filled the gaps left by nature, and furnished the family with desired heirs. For this purpose some chance orphan might be brought into the household, one of those poor little creatures consigned by their mothers to the river, as in the case of Shargani, according to the ancient legend, or who had been exposed at the crossroads to excite the pity of passers-by, like the foundling whose story is given us in an old ballad. He who had neither father nor mother, he who knew not his father or mother, but whose earliest memory is of a well, whose entry into the world was in the street, his benefactor snatched him from the jaws of dogs, and took him from the beaks of ravens. He seized the seal before witnesses, and he marked him on the sole of the foot with the seal of the witness, and he entrusted him to a nurse, and for three years provided the nurse with flour, oil, and clothing. When the weaning was accomplished, he appointed him to be his child, he brought him up to be his child, he inscribed him as his child, and he gave him the education of a scribe. The rights of adoption in these cases did not differ from those attendant upon birth. On both occasions the newly born infant was shown to witnesses, and it was marked on the soles of its feet to establish its identity. Its registration in the family archives did not take place until these precautions had been observed, and children adopted in this manner were regarded thenceforward in the eyes of the world as the legitimate heirs of the family. People desiring to adopt a child usually made inquiries among their acquaintances or poor friends, or cousins who might consent to give up one of their sons, in the hope of securing a better future for him. When he happened to be a minor, the real father and mother, or in the case of the death of one, the surviving parent, appeared before the scribe, and relinquished all their rights in favor of the adopting parents. The latter, in accepting this act of renunciation, promised thenceforth to treat the child as if he were of their own flesh and blood, and often settled upon him at the same time a certain sum chargeable on their own patrimony. When the adopted son was of age, his consent to the agreement was required in addition to that of his parents. The adoption was sometimes prompted by an interested motive, and not merely the desire for posterity or its semblance. Labor was expensive, slaves were scarce, and children, by working for their father, took the place of hired servants, and were content like them with food and clothing. The adoption of adults was, therefore, most frequent in ancient times. The introduction of a person into a fresh household severed the ties which bound him to the old one. He became a stranger to those who had borne him. He had no filial obligations to discharge to them, nor had he any right to whatever property they might possess, unless, indeed, any unforeseen circumstance prevented the carrying out of the agreement, and legally obliged him to return to the status of his birth. In return, he undertook all the duties and enjoyed the privileges of his new position. He owed to his adopted parents the same amount of work, obedience, and respect that he would have given to his natural parents. He shared in their condition, whether for good or ill, and he inherited their possessions. Provision was made for him in case of his repudiation by those who had adopted him, and they had to make him compensation. He received the portion which would have accrued to him after their death, and he left them. Families appeared to have been fairly united, in spite of the elasticity of the laws which governed them, and of the diverse elements of which they were sometimes composed. No doubt polygamy and frequent divorce exercised here as elsewhere a deleterious influence. The harems of Babylon were constantly the scenes of endless intrigues and quarrels among the women and children of varied condition and different parentage who filled them. Among the people of the middle classes, where restricted means necessarily prevented a man having many wives, the course of family life appears to have been as calm and affectionate as in Egypt, under the unquestioned supremacy of the father, and in the event of his early death, the widow, and later the son or son-in-law, took the direction of affairs. Should quarrels arise and reach the point of bringing about a complete rupture between parents and children, the law intervened. 
not to reconcile them, but to repress any violence of which either side might be guilty towards the other. It was reckoned as a misdemeanor for any father or mother to disown a child, and they were punished by being kept shut up in their own house, as long, doubtless, as they persisted in disowning it. But it was a crime in a son, even if he were an adopted son, to renounce his parents, and he was punished severely. If he had said to his father, Thou art not my father, the latter marked him with a conspicuous sign and sold him in the market. If he had said to his mother, As for thee, thou art not my mother, he was similarly branded, and led through the streets or along the roads, where with hue and cry he was driven from the town and province. The slaves were numerous, but distributed in unequal proportion among the various classes of the population. Whilst in the palace they might be found literally in crowds, it was rare among the middle classes to meet with any family possessing more than two or three at a time. They were drawn partly from foreign races, prisoners who had been wounded and carried from the field of battle, or fugitives who had fallen into the hands of the victors after a defeat, or Elamites or Gutis who had been surprised in their own villages during some expedition, not to mention people of every category carried off by the Bedouin during their raids in distant parts, such as Syria or Egypt, whom they were continually bringing for sale to Babylon and Uru, and, indeed, to all those cities to which they had easy access. The kings, the vicegerents, the temple administration, and the feudal lords provided employment for vast numbers in the construction of their buildings or in the cultivation of their domains. The work was hard and the mortality great, but gaps were soon filled up by the influx of fresh gangs. The survivors intermarried, and their children, brought up to speak the Chaldean tongue and conforming to the customs of the country, became assimilated to the ruling race. They formed, beneath the superior native Semite and Sumerian population, an inferior servile class, spread alike throughout the towns and country, who were continually reinforced by individuals of the native race, such as foundlings, women and children sold by father or husband, debtors deprived by creditors of their liberty, and criminals judiciously condemned. The law took no individual account of them, but counted them by heads as so many cattle. They belonged to their respective masters in the same fashion as did the beasts of his flock or the trees of his garden, and their life or death was dependent upon his will, though the exercise of his rights was naturally restrained by interest and custom. He could use them as pledges or for payment of a debt, could exchange them or sell them in the market. The price of a slave never rose very high. A woman might be bought for four and a half shekels of silver by weight, and the value of a male adult fluctuated between ten shekels and the third of a mina. The bill of sale was inscribed on clay and given to the purchaser at the time of payment. The tablets which were the vouchers of the rights of the former proprietor were then broken, and the transfer was completed. The master seldom ill-treated his slaves, except in cases of reiterated disobedience, rebellion, or flight, he could arrest his runaway slaves wherever he could lay his hands upon them. He could shackle their ankles, fetter their wrists, and whip them mercilessly. As a rule, he permitted them to marry and bring up a family. He apprenticed their children, and as soon as they knew a trade, he set them up in business in his own name, allowing them a share in the profits. The more intelligent among them were trained to be clerks or stewards. They were taught to read, write, and calculate, the essential accomplishment of a skillful scribe. They were appointed as superintendents over their former comrades, or overseers of the administration of property, and they ended by becoming confidential servants in the household. The savings which they had accumulated in their earlier years furnished them with the means of procuring some few consolations. They could hire themselves out for wages, and could even acquire slaves who would go out to work for them, in the same way as they themselves had been a source of income to their proprietors. If they followed a lucrative profession and were successful in it, their savings sometimes permitted them to buy their own freedom, and if they were married, to pay the ransom of their wife and children. At times their master, desirous of rewarding long and faithful service, liberated them of his own accord, without waiting till they had saved up the necessary money or goods for their enfranchisement. In such cases they remained his dependents, and continued in his service as freemen, to perform the services they had formerly rendered as slaves. They then enjoyed the same rights and advantages as the old native race, they could leave legacies, inherit property, claim legal rights, and acquire and possess houses and lands. Their sons could make good matches among the daughters of the middle classes, according to their education and fortune. When they were intelligent, active, and industrious, there was nothing to prevent them from rising to the highest offices about the person of the sovereign. End of section 34. 
Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 35 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3 by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3 Chaldean Civilization, Part 8. If we knew more of the internal history of the great Chaldean cities, we should no doubt come to see what an important part the servile element played in them, and could we trace it back for a few generations, we should probably discover that there were few great families who did not reckon a slave or freedman among their ancestors. It would be interesting to follow this people, made up of such complex elements, in all their daily work and recreation, as we are able to do in the case of contemporary Egyptians, but the monuments which might furnish us with the necessary materials are scarce, and the positive information to be gleaned from them amounts to but little. We are tolerably safe, however, in supposing the more wealthy cities to have been, as a whole, very similar in appearance to those existing at the present day, in the regions which as yet have been scarcely touched by the advent of European civilization. Sinuous, narrow, muddy streets, littered with domestic refuse and organic detritus, in which flocks of ravens and wandering packs of dogs perform with more or less efficiency the duties of sanitary officers, whole quarters of the town composed of huts made of reeds and puddled clay, low houses of crude brick, surmounted perhaps even in those times with the conical domes we find later on the Assyrian bas-reliefs, crowded and noisy bazaars, where each trade is located in its special lanes and blind alleys, silent and desolate spaces occupied by palaces and gardens, in which the private life of the wealthy was concealed from public gaze, and looking down upon this medley of individual dwellings, the palaces and temples with their ziggurats crowned with gilded and painted sanctuaries. In the ruins of Eru, Iridu, and Uruk, the remains of houses belonging doubtless to well-to-do families have been brought to light. They are built of fine bricks, whose courses are cemented together with a thin layer of bitumen, but they are lighted only internally by small apertures pierced at irregular distances in the upper part of the walls. The low arched doorway, closed by a heavy two-leaved door, leads into a blind passage, which opens as a rule on the courtyard in the centre of the building. In the interior may still be distinguished the small oblong rooms, sometimes vaulted, sometimes roofed with a flat ceiling supported by trunks of palm trees, the walls are often of a considerable thickness, in which are found narrow niches here and there. The majority of the rooms were merely store chambers, and contained the family provisions and treasures. Others served as living rooms, and were provided with furniture. The latter, in the houses of the richer citizens no less than in those of the people, was of a very simple kind, and was mostly composed of chairs and stools, similar to those in the royal palaces. The bedrooms contained the linen chests and the beds with their thin mattresses, coverings, and cushions, and perhaps wooden headrests resembling those found in Africa, but the Chaldeans slept mostly on mats spread on the ground. An oven for baking occupied a corner of the courtyard, side by side with the stones for grinding the corn. The ashes on the hearth were always aglow, and if by chance the fire went out, the fire stick was always at hand to relight it, as in Egypt. The kitchen utensils and household pottery comprised a few large copper pans and earthenware pots rounded at the base, dishes, water and wine jars, and heavy plates of coarse ware. Metal had not as yet superseded stone, and in the same house we meet with bronze axes and hammers side by side with the same implements in cut flint, besides knives, scrapers, and mace heads. At the present day, the women of the country of the Euphrates spend a great part of their time on the roofs of their dwellings. They install themselves there in the morning, till they are driven away by the heat. As soon as the sun gets low in the heavens, they return to their post, and either pass the day on neighboring roofs while they bake, cook, wash, and dry the linen, or if they have slaves to attend to such menial occupations, they sew and embroider in the open air. They come down into the interior of the house during the hottest hours of the day. In most of the wealthy houses, the coolest room is one below the level of the courtyard, into which but little light can penetrate. It is paved with plaques of polished gypsum, which resemble our finest gray and white marble, 
and the walls are covered with a coat of delicate plastering, smooth to the touch and agreeable to the eye. This is watered several times during the day in hot weather, and the evaporation from it cools the air. The few ruined habitations which have as yet been explored seem to bear witness to a considerable similarity between the requirements and customs of ancient times and those of to-day. Like the modern women of Baghdad and Mosul, the Chaldean women of old preferred an existence in the open air, in spite of its publicity, to a seclusion within stuffy rooms or narrow courts. The heat of the sun, cold, rain, and illness obliged them at times to seek a refuge within four walls, but as soon as they could conveniently escape from them, they climbed up onto their roof to pass the greater part of their time there. Many families of the lower and middle classes owned the houses which they occupied. They constituted a patrimony which the owners made every effort to preserve intact through all reverses of fortune. The head of the family bequeathed it to his widow or his eldest son, or left it undivided to his heirs, in the assurance no doubt that one of them would buy up the rights of the others. The remainder of his goods, farms, gardens, cornlands, slaves, furniture, and jewels were divided among the brothers or natural descendants, from the mouth to the gold, that is to say, from the moment of announcing the beginning of the business, to that when each one received his share. In order to invest this act with greater solemnity, it took place usually in the presence of a priest. Those interested repaired to the temple, to the gate of the god. They placed the whole of the inheritance in the hands of the chosen arbitrator, and demanded of him to divide it justly, or the eldest brother perhaps anticipated the apportionment, and the priest had merely to sanction the result, or settle the differences which might arise among the lawful recipients in the course of the operation. When this was accomplished, the legatees had to declare themselves satisfied, and when no further claims arose, they had to sign an agreement before the priestly arbitrator that they would henceforth refrain from all quarrelling on the subject, and that they would never make a complaint one against the other. By dint of these continual redistributions from one generation to another, the largest fortunes soon became dispersed, the individual shares became smaller and smaller, and scarcely sufficed to keep a family, so that the slightest reverse obliged the possessor to have recourse to usurers. The Chaldeans, like the Egyptians, were unacquainted with the use of money, but from the earliest times the employment of precious metals for the purpose of exchange was practised among them to an enormous extent. Though copper and gold were both used, silver was the principal medium in these transactions, and formed the standard value of all purchasable objects. It was never cut into flat rings or twists of wire, as was the case with the Egyptian tabnu. It was melted into small unstamped ingots, which were passed from hand to hand by weight, being tested in the scales at each transaction. To weigh was in the ordinary language the equivalent for payment in metal, whereas to measure denoted the payment was in grain. The ingots for exchange were, therefore, designated by the name of the weights to which they corresponded. The lowest unit was a shekel, weighing on an average nearly half an ounce, sixty shekels making a mina, and sixty minas a talent. It is a question whether the Chaldeans possessed in early times, as did the Assyrians of a later period, two kinds of shekels and minas, one heavy and the other light. Whether the loan were in metal, grain, or any other substance, the interest was very high. A very ancient law fixed it in certain cases at twelve drachmas per mina per annum, that is to say, at twenty-five per cent, and more recent texts show us that, when raised to twenty-five per cent, it did not appear to them abnormal. The commerce of the chief cities was almost entirely concentrated in the temples. The large quantities of metals and cereals constantly brought to the god, either as part of the fixed temple revenue, or as daily offerings, accumulated so rapidly that they would have overflown the storehouses had not a means been devised of utilizing them quickly. The priests treated them as articles of commerce and made a profit out of them. Every bargain necessitated the calling in of a public scribe. The bill, drawn up before witnesses on a clay tablet, enumerated the sums paid out, the names of the parties, the rate per cent, the date of repayment, and sometimes a penal clause in the event of fraud or insolvency. The tablet remained in the possession of the creditor until the debt had been completely discharged. The borrower often gave as a pledge either slaves, a field, or a house, or certain of his friends would pledge on his behalf their own personal fortune. At times he would pay by the labor of his own hands the interest 
which he would otherwise have been unable to meet, and the stipulation was previously made in the contract of the number of days of corvée, which he should periodically fulfil for his creditor. If, in spite of all this, the debtor was unable to procure the necessary funds to meet his engagements, the principal became augmented by a fixed sum, for instance one-third, and continued to increase at this rate until the total value of the amount reached that of the security. The slave, the field, or the house then ceased to belong to their former master, subject to a right of redemption, of which he was rarely able to avail himself for lack of means. End of section 35. Read by Professor Heather and by. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 36 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 9. The small tradesmen or free workmen, who by some accident had become involved in debt, seldom escaped this progressive impoverishment except by strenuous efforts and incessant labor. Foreign commerce, it is true, entailed considerable risk but the chances of acquiring wealth were so great that many individuals launched upon it in preference to more sure but less lucrative undertakings. They would set off alone or in companies for Elam or the northern regions, for Syria or even for so distant a country as Egypt, and they would bring back in their caravans all that was accounted precious in those lands. Overland routes were not free from dangers. Not only were nomad tribes and professional bandits constantly hovering round the traveller, and obliging him to exercise ceaseless vigilance, but the inhabitants of the villages through which he passed, the local lords and the kings of the countries which he traversed, had no scruple in levying blackmail upon him, obliging him to pay dearly for right of way through their marches or territory. There were less risks in choosing a sea route. The Euphrates on one side, the Tigris, the Ulai, and the Uknu on the other, ran through a country peopled with a rich industrial population among whom Chaldean merchandise was easily and profitably sold, or exchanged for commodities which would command a good price at the end of the voyage. The vessels generally were Kelex or Kufas, but the latter were of immense size. Several individuals, as a rule, would club together to hire one of these boats and freight it with a suitable cargo. The body of the boat was very light, being made of osier or willow covered with skins sewn together. A layer of straw was spread on the bottom, on which were piled the bales or chests, which were again protected by a rough thatch of straw. The crew was composed of two oarsmen at least, and sometimes a few donkeys. The merchants then pursued their way upstream till they had disposed of their cargo, and taken in a sufficient freight for their return voyage. The dangers, though apparently not so great as those by the land route, were not the less real. The boat was liable to sink, or run aground near the bank, the dwellers in the neighborhood of the river might intercept it and pillage its contents, a war might break out between two contiguous kingdoms and suspend all commerce, the merchant's career continually vacillated between servitude, death, and fortune. Business carried on at home in the towns was seldom the means of enriching a man, and sometimes scarcely afforded him a means of livelihood. Rent was high for those who had not a house of their own, the least they could expect to pay was half a silver shekel per annum, but the average price was a whole shekel. On taking possession they paid a deposit, which sometimes amounted to one-third of the whole sum, the remainder being due at the end of the year. The leases lasted, as a rule, merely a twelve-month, though sometimes they were extended for terms of greater length, such as two, three, or even eight years. The cost of repairs and of keeping the house in good condition fell usually upon the lessee, who was also allowed to build upon the land he had leased, in which case it was declared free of all charges for a period of about ten years. But the house, and as a rule, all that he had built, then reverted to the landlord. Most possessors of shops made their own goods for sale, assisted by slaves or free apprentices. Every workman taught his own trade to his children, and these in their turn would instruct theirs. Families which had an hereditary profession or from generation to generation had gathered bands of workmen about them, formed themselves into various guilds, or, to use the customary term, into tribes, governed by chiefs and following specified customs. A workman belonged to the tribe of the weavers, or of the blacksmiths, 
or of the corn merchants, and the description of an individual would not have been considered as sufficiently exact if the designation of his tribe were not inserted after his name, in addition to his paternal affiliation. The organization was like that of Egypt, but more fully developed. The various trades, moreover, were almost the same among the two peoples, exceptions being such as are readily accounted for by the differences in the nature of the soil and physical constitution of the respective countries. We do not meet on the banks of the Euphrates with those corporations of stone-cutters and marble-workers which were so numerous in the valley of the Nile. The vast Chaldean plain, in the absence of mountains or accessible quarries, would have furnished no occupation for them. The Chaldeans had to go a long way in quest of the small quantities of limestone, alabaster, or diorite, which they required, and which they reserved only for details of architectural decoration, for which a small number of artisans and sculptors were amply sufficient. The manufacture of bricks, on the other hand, made great progress. The crude bricks were larger than those of Egypt, and they were more enduring, composed of finer clay and better executed. The manufacture of burnt brick, too, was carried on to a degree of perfection to which Memphis or Thebes never attained. An ancient legend ascribes the invention of the bricks, and consequently the construction of the earliest cities, jointly to Sin, the eldest son of Bel, and Ninib his brother. This event was said to have taken place in May-June, and from that time forward the third month of the year, over which the twins presided, was called Merga and Sumerian, Simanu in the Semitic speech, the month of brick. This was the season which was especially devoted to the process of their manufacture. The flood in the rivers, which was very great in the preceding months, then began to subside, and the clay which was deposited by the waters during the weeks of overflow, washed and refined as it was, lent itself readily to the occupation. The sun, moreover, gave forth sufficient heat to dry the clay blocks in a uniform and gradual manner. Later, in July and August, they would crack under the ardor of his rays, and become converted externally into a friable mass, while their interior would remain too moist to allow them to be prudently used in carefully built structures. The work of brick-making was inaugurated with festivals and sacrifices to Sin, Merodach, Nebo, and all the deities who were concerned in the art of building. Further religious ceremonies were observed at intervals during the month to sanctify the progress of the work. The manufacture did not cease on the last day of the month, but was continued with more or less activity, according to the heat of the sun, and the importance of the orders received, until the return of the inundation. But the bricks intended for public buildings, temples, or palaces could not be made outside a prescribed limit of time. The shades of color produced naturally in the process of burning, red or yellow, gray or brown, were not pleasant to the eye, and they were accustomed, therefore, to coat the bricks with an attractive enamel which preserved them from the disintegrating effects of sun and rain. The paste was laid on on the edges or sides while the brick was in a crude state, and was incorporated with it by vitrification in the heat of the kiln. The process was known from an early date in Egypt, but was rarely employed in the decoration of buildings, while in Chaldea the use of such enameled plaques was common. The substructures of palaces and the exterior walls of temples were left unadorned, but the shrines which crowned the ziggurat, the reception halls, and the headings of doors were covered with these many-colored tiles. Fragments of them are found today in the ruins of the cities, and the analysis of these pieces shows the marvelous skill of the ancient workers in enamel. The shades of color are pure and pleasant to the eye, while the material is so evenly put on and so solid that neither centuries of burial in a sodden soil, nor the wear and tear of transport, nor the exposure to the damp of our museums, have succeeded in diminishing their brilliance and freshness. To get a clear idea of the industrial operations of the country, it would be necessary to see the various corporations at their work, as we are able to do, in the case of Egypt, in the scenes of the mastabas of Saqqara, or of the rock chambers of Beni Hassan. The manufacture of stone implements gave considerable employment, and the equipment of the dead in the tombs of Uru would have been a matter of small moment, if we were able to exclude its flint implements, its knives, cleavers, scrapers, adzes, axes, and hammers. The cutting of these objects is bold, and the final touches show skill, but we rarely meet with a purity of contour and intensity of polish which distinguish similar objects among Western peoples. 
A few examples, it is true, are of fairly artistic shape, and bear engraved inscriptions. One of these, a flint hammer of beautiful form, belonged to a god, probably Aemon, and it seems to have come from a temple in which one of its owners had deposited it. It is an exception, and a remarkable exception. Stone was the material of the implements of the poor, implements which were coarse in shape, and cost little. If much care were given to their execution, they would come to be so costly that no one could buy them, or if sold for a moderate sum, the seller would obtain no profit from the transaction. Beyond a certain price, it was more advantageous to purchase metal implements, of copper in the early ages, afterwards of bronze, and lastly of iron. Among the metal founders and smiths all kind of examples of these were to be found. Axes of an elegant and graceful design, hammers and knives, as well as culinary and domestic utensils, cups, cauldrons, dishes, mountings of doors and coffers, statuettes of men, bulls, monsters and gods, which could be turned to weapons of all descriptions, arrow and lance heads, swords, daggers, and rounded helmets with neck-piece or visor. End of section 36 Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 37 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3 Chaldean Civilization, Part 10. Some of the metal objects manufactured by the Chaldeans attained large dimensions. For instance, the brazen seas which were set up before each sanctuary, either for the purpose of receiving the libations, or for the prescribed rites of purification. As is often the case among half-civilized peoples, the goldsmiths worked in the precious metals with much facility and skill. We have not succeeded up to the present time in finding any of those golden images which the kings were accustomed to dedicate in the temples out of their own possessions, or the spoil obtained from the enemy. But a silver vase dedicated to Ningirsu by Atena, vicegerent of Lagash, gives us some idea of this department of the temple furniture. It stands upright on a small square bronze pedestal with four feet. A piously expressed inscription runs round the neck, and the bowl of the vase is divided horizontally into two divisions, framed above and below by twisted cordwork. Four two-headed eagles, with outspread wings and tail, occupy the lower division. They are in the act of seizing with their claws two animals, placed back to back, represented in the act of walking. The intervals between the eagles are filled up alternatively by two lions, two wild goats, and two stags. Above, and close to the rise of the neck, are disposed seven heifers lying down and all looking in the same direction. They are all engraved upon the flat metal, and are without relief or incrustation. The whole composition is harmoniously put together. The posture of the animals and their general form are well conceived and boldly rendered, but the details of the mane of the lions and the feathers of the eagles are reproduced with a realism and attention to minutiae which belong to the infancy of art. This single example of ancient goldsmith's work would be sufficient to prove that the early Chaldeans were not a whit behind the Egyptians in this handicraft, even if we had not the golden ornaments, the bracelets, ear, and finger rings to judge from, with which the tombs have furnished us in considerable numbers. Alongside the goldsmiths there must have been a whole army of lapidaries and gem-cutters occupied in the engraving of cylinders. Numerous and delicate operations were required to metamorphose a scrap of crude rock, marble, granite, agate, onyx, green and red jasper, crystal or lapis lazuli, into one of those marvellous seals which are now found by the hundreds scattered throughout the museums of Europe. They had to be rounded, reduced to the proper proportions, and polished, before the subject or legend could be engraved upon them with the burin. To drill a hole through them required great dexterity, and some of the lapidaries, from a dread of breaking the cylinder, either did not pierce it at all, or merely bored a shallow hole into each extremity to allow it to roll freely in its metallic mounting. The tools used in engraving were similar to those employed at the present day, but of a rougher kind. The burin, which was often nothing more than a flint point, marked out the area of the design, and sketched out the figures. The saw was largely employed to cut away the depressions, when these required no detailed handling, and lastly, the drill, 
either worked with the hand or in a kind of lathe, was made to indicate the joints and muscles of the individual by a series of round holes. The object thus summarily dealt with might be regarded as sufficiently worked for ordinary clients, but those who were willing to pay for them could obtain cylinders from which every mark of the tool had been adroitly removed, and where the beauty of the workmanship vied with the costliness of the material. The seal of Shargani, king of Agade, that of Bingani Shur Ali, and many others which have been picked up by chance in the excavations, are true bas-reliefs, reduced and condensed, so to speak, to the space of something like a square inch of surface, but conceived with an artistic ingenuity and executed with a boldness which modern engravers have rarely equalled and never surpassed. There are traces on them, it is true, of some of the defects which disfigured the latter work of the Assyrians, heaviness of form, exaggerated prominence of muscles and hardness of outline, but there are also all the qualities which distinguish an original and forcible art. The countries of the Euphrates were renowned in classic times for the beauty of the embroidered and painted stuff which they manufactured. Nothing has come down to us of these Babylonian tissues, of which the Greek and Latin writers extolled the magnificence. But we may form some idea, from the statues and the figures engraved on cylinders, of what the weavers and embroiders of this ancient time were capable. The loom which they made use of differed but slightly from the horizontal loom commonly employed in the Nile Valley, and everything tends to show that their plain linen cloths were of the kind represented in the swathings and fragments of clothing still to be found in the sepulchral chambers of Memphis and Thebes. The manufacture of fleecy woolen garments, so much affected by men and women alike, indicates a great dexterity. When once the threads of the woof had been stretched, those of the warp were attached to them by knots in as many parallel lines, at regular intervals, as there were rows of fringe to be displayed. On the surface of the cloth, the loops thus formed being allowed to hang down in their respective places. Sometimes these loops were retained just as they stood, sometimes they were cut, and the ends frayed out so as to give the appearance of a shaggy texture. Most of these stuffs preserved their original white or creamy color especially those woven at home by the women for the requirements of their own toilette, and for the ordinary uses of the household. The Chaldeans, however, like many other Asiatic peoples, had a strong preference for lively colors, and the outdoor garments and gala attire of the rich were distinguished by a profusion of blue patterns on a red ground, or red upon blue, arranged in stripes, zigzags, checks, and dots or circles. There must, therefore, have been as much occupation for dyers as there was for weavers, and it is possible that the two operations were carried out by the same bands. We know nothing of the bakers, butchers, carriers, masons, and other artisans who supplied the necessities of the cities. They were doubtless able to make two ends meet and nothing more, and if we should succeed some day in obtaining information about them, we shall probably find that their condition was as miserable as that of their Egyptian contemporaries. The course of their lives was monotonous enough, except when it was broken at prescribed intervals by the ordinary festivals in honor of the gods of the city, or by the casual suspensions of work occasioned by the triumphant return of the king from some warlike expedition, or by his inauguration of a new temple. The gaiety of the people on such occasions was the more exuberant in proportion to the undisturbed monotony or misery of the days which preceded them. As soon, for instance, as Gudea had brought to completion in Nunu, the house of his patron Ningirsu, he felt relieved from the strain and washed his hands. For seven days no grain was brushed in the quern, the maid was the equal of her mistress, the servant walked in the same rank as his master, the strong and the weak rested side by side in the city. The world seemed topsy-turvy, as during the Roman Saturnalia, the classes mingled together, and the inferiors were probably accustomed to abuse the unusual license which they momentarily enjoyed. When the festival was over, social distinctions reasserted themselves, and each one fell back into his accustomed position. Life was not so pleasant in Chaldea as in Egypt. The innumerable promissory notes, the receipted accounts, the contracts of sale and purchase, these cunningly drawn-up deeds which have been deciphered by the hundred, revealed to us a people greedy of gain, exacting, litigious, of artisans in Egypt. This is taken from a source belonging to the twelfth or possibly the thirteenth dynasty. We may assume, from the fact that the two civilizations were about on the same level, that the information supplied in this respect by the Egyptian monuments 
is generally applicable to the condition of Chaldean workmen of the same period. The Chaldeans were almost exclusively absorbed by material concerns. The climate, too, variable and oppressive in summer and winter alike, imposed upon the Chaldean painful exactions, and obliged him to work with an energy of which the majority of Egyptians would not have felt themselves capable. The Chaldean, suffering greater and more prolonged hardships, earned more doubtless, but was not on this account the happier. However lucrative his calling might be, it was not sufficiently so to supply him always with domestic necessities, and both tradespeople and operatives were obliged to run into debt to supplement their straitened means. When they had once fallen into the hands of the usurer, the exorbitant interest which they had to pay kept them a long time in his power. If, when the bill fell due, there was nothing to meet it, it had to be renewed under still more disastrous conditions. As the pledge given was usually the homestead, or the slave who assisted in the trade, or the garden which supplied food for the family, the mortgager was reduced to the extreme of misery if he could not satisfy his creditors. This plague of usury was not, moreover, confined to the towns. It raged with equal violence in the country, and the farmers also became its victims. If, theoretically, the earth belonged to the gods, and under them to the kings, the latter had made, and continued daily to make, such large concessions of it to their vassals, that the greater part of the domains were always in the hands of the nobles or private individuals. These could dispose of their landed property at pleasure, farm it out, sell it, or distribute it among their heirs and friends. End of section 37. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audio books or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 38 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 11. They paid, on account of it, a tax which varied at different epochs, but which was always burdensome. But when they had once satisfied this exaction, and paid the dues which the temples might claim on behalf of the gods, neither the state nor any individual had the right to interfere in their administration of it, or put any restrictions upon them. Some proprietors cultivated their lands themselves, the poor by their own labor, the rich by the aid of some trustworthy slave, whom they interested in the success of his farming, by assigning him a certain percentage on the net return. Sometimes the lands were leased out in whole or in part to free peasants, who relieved the proprietors of all the worry and risks of managing it themselves. A survey of the area of each state had been made at an early age, and the lots into which it had been divided were registered on clay tablets, containing the name of the proprietor, as well as those of his neighbors, together with such indications of the features of the land, dikes, canals, rivers, and buildings, as would serve to define its boundaries. Rough plans accompanied the description, and in the most complicated instances interpreted it to the eye. This survey was frequently repeated, and enabled the sovereign to arrange his scheme of taxation on a solid basis, and to calculate the product of it without material error. Gardens and groves of date-palms, together with large regions devoted to rough attempts at vegetable culture, were often to be met with, especially in the neighborhood of towns. These paid their contributions to the state, as well as the owner's rent, in kind, in fruit, vegetables, and fresh or dried dates. The best soil was reserved for the growth of wheat and other cereals, and its extent was measured in terms of corn. Corn was also the standard in which the revenue was reckoned, both in public and private contracts. Such and such a field required about fifty liters of seed to the aurora. Another needed sixty-two, or seventy-five, according to the fertility of the land and its locality. Landed property was placed under the guardianship of the gods and its transfer or cession was accompanied by formalities of a half-religious, half-magical character. The party giving delivery of it called down upon the head of any one who would dare in the future to dispute the validity of the deed, imprecations of which the text was inserted on a portion of the surface of an egg-shaped nodule of flint, basalt, or other hard stone. These little monuments display on their cone-shaped end a series of figures, sometimes arranged in two parallel divisions, sometimes scattered over the surface, which represent the deities invoked to watch over the sanctity of the contract. 
it was a kind of representation in miniature of the aspect which the heavens presented to the Chaldeans. The disks of the sun and moon, together with Venus Ashtar, are the prominent elements in the scene. The zodiacal figures, or the symbols employed to represent them, are arranged in an apparent orbit around these, such as the scorpion, the bird, the dog, the thunderbolt of Raman, the mace, the horned monsters, half hidden by the temples they guard, and the enormous dragon who embraces in his folds half the entire firmament. If ever, in the course of days, any one of the brothers, children, family, men or women, slaves or servants of the house, or any governor or functionary whatsoever, arises and intends to steal this field, and remove this landmark, either to make a gift of it to a god, or to assign it to a competitor, or to appropriate it to himself, if he modifies the area of it, the limits and the landmark, if he divides it into portions, and if he says, the field has no owner, since there has been no donation of it, if from the dread of the terrible imprecations which protect this stella and the field, he sends a fool, a deaf or blind person, a wicked wretch, an idiot, a stranger, or an ignorant one, and should cause this stella to be taken away, and should throw it into the water, cover it with dust, mutilate it by scratching it with a stone, burn it in the fire and destroy it, or write anything else upon it, or carry it away to a place where it will be no longer seen, this man, may Anu, Bel, Ea, the exalted lady, the great gods, cast upon him looks of wrath, may they destroy his strength, may they exterminate his race. All the immortals are associated in this excommunication, and each one promises in his turn the aid of his power. Merodach, by whose spells the sick are restored, will inflict upon the guilty one a dropsy which no incantation can cure. Shamash, the supreme judge, will send forth against him one of his inexorable judgments. Sin, the inhabitant of the brilliant heavens, will cover him with leprosy as with a garment. Adar, the warrior, will break his weapons, and Zamama, the king of strifes, will not stand by him on the field of battle. Eamon will let loose his tempest upon his fields, and will overwhelm them. The whole band of the invisibles hold themselves ready to defend the rights of the proprietor against all attacks. In no part of the ancient world was the sacred character of property so forcibly laid down, or the possession of the soil more firmly secured by religion. In instruments of agriculture and modes of cultivation, Chaldea was no better off than Egypt. The rapidity with which the river rose in the spring, and its variable subsistence from year to year, furnished little inducement to the Chaldeans to entrust to it the work of watering their lands. On the contrary, they were compelled to protect themselves from it, and to keep at a distance the volume of waters it brought down. Each property, whether of square, triangular, or any other shape, was surrounded with a continuous earth-built barrier which bounded it on every side, and served at the same time as a rampart against the inundation. Rows of shadoofs installed along the banks of the canals or streams provided for the irrigation of the lands. The fields were laid out like a chessboard, and the squares, separated from each other by earthen ridges, formed as it were so many basins. When the elevation of the ground arrested the flow of the waters, these were collected into reservoirs, whence by the use of other shadoofs they were raised to a higher level. The plough was nothing more than an obliquely placed metoc whose handle was lengthened in order to harness oxen to it. Whilst the ploughman pressed heavily on the handle, two attendants kept incessantly goading the beasts, or urging them forward with voice and whip, and a third scattered the seed in the furrow. A considerable capital was needed to ensure success in agricultural undertakings. Contracts were made for three years, and stipulated that payments should be made partly in metal and partly in the products of the soil. The farmer paid a small sum when entering into possession, and the remainder of the debt was gradually liquidated at the end of each of twelve months, the payment being in silver one year, and in corn the two following. The rent varied according to the quality of the soil and the facilities which it afforded for cultivation. A field, for instance, of three bushels was made to pay nine hundred measures, while another of ten bushels had only eighteen hundred to pay. In many instances the peasant preferred to take the proprietor into partnership, the latter in such case providing all the expenses of cultivation, on the understanding that he should receive two-thirds of the gross product. The tenant was obliged to administer the estate as a careful householder during the term of his lease. He was to maintain the buildings and implements in good repair, 
to see that the hedges were kept up, to keep the shadoofs in working order, and to secure the good condition of the watercourses. He had rarely enough slaves to manage the business with profit. Those he had purchased were sufficient, with the aid of his wives and children, to carry on ordinary operations. But when any pressure arose, especially at harvest time, he had to seek elsewhere the additional laborers he required. The temples were the chief source of the supply of these. The majority of the supplementary laborers were free men, who were hired out by their family, or engaged themselves for a fixed term, during which they were subject to a sort of slavery, the conditions of which were determined by law. The workman renounced his liberty for fifteen days, or a month, or for a whole year. He disposed, so to speak, of a portion of his life to the provisional master of his choice, and if he did not enter upon his work at the day agreed upon, or if he showed himself inactive in the duties assigned to him, he was liable to severe punishment. He received in exchange for his labor his food, lodging, and clothing, and if an accident should occur to him during the term of his service, the law granted him an indemnity in proportion to the injury he had sustained. His average wage was from four to six shekels of silver per annum. He was also entitled by custom to another shekel in the form of a retaining fee, and he could claim his pay, which was given to him mostly in corn, in monthly installments, if his agreement were for a considerable time, and daily if it were for a short period. The mercenary never fell into the condition of the ordinary serf. He retained his rights as a man, and possessed in the person of the patron for whom he labored, or whom he himself had selected, a defender of his interests. When he came to the end of his engagement, he returned to his family, and resumed his ordinary occupation until the next occasion. Many of the farmers in a small way earned thus, in a few weeks, sufficient means to supplement their own modest personal income. Others sought out more permanent occupations, and hired themselves out as regular farm servants. The lands which neither the rise of the river nor the irrigation system could reach, so far as to render fit for agriculture, were reserved for the pasture of the flocks in the springtime, when they were covered with rich grass. The presence of lions in the neighborhood, however, obliged the husbandmen to take precautions for the safety of their flocks. They constructed provisional enclosures into which the animals were driven every evening, when the pastures were too far off to allow the flocks being brought back to the sheepfold. The chase was a favorite pastime among them, and few days passed without the hunters bringing back with him a young gazelle caught in a trap, or a hare killed by an arrow. These formed substantial additions to the larder, for the Chaldeans do not seem to have kept about them, as the Egyptians did, such tamed animals as cranes or herons, gazelles or deer. They contented themselves with the useful species, oxen, asses, sheep, and goats. Some of the ancient monuments, cylinders, and clay tablets reproduce in a rough manner scenes from pastoral life. The door of the fold opens, and we see a flock of goats sallying forth to the cracking of the herdsman's whip. When they reach the pasture they scatter over the meadows, and while the shepherd keeps his eye upon them, he plays upon his reed to the delight of his dog. In the meantime the farm people are engaged in the careful preparation of the evening meal. Two individuals on opposite sides of the hearth watch the pot boiling between them, while a baker makes his dough into round cakes. End of section 38. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 39 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3 by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3 Chaldean Civilization, Part 12. Sometimes a quarrel breaks out among the comrades, and leads to a stand up fight with the fists, or a lion, perhaps, in quest of a meal, surprises and kills one of the bulls. The shepherd runs up, his axe in his hand, to contend bravely with the marauder for the possession of his beast. The shepherd was accustomed to provide himself with assistance in the shape of enormous dogs, who had no more hesitation in attacking beasts of prey than they had in pursuing game. In these combats the natural courage of the shepherd was stimulated by interest, for he was personally responsible for the safety of his flock, if a lion should find an entrance into one of the enclosures. Fishing was not so much a pastime as a source of livelihood, for fish occupied a high place in the bill of fare of the common folk. Caught by the line, net, or trap, it was dried in the sun, smoked or salted. The chase was essentially the pastime of the great noble, 
the pursuit of the lion and the bear in the wooded covers or the marshy thickets of the river-bank, the pursuit of the gazelle, the ostrich, and bustard on the elevated plains or rocky tablelands of the desert. The onager of Mesopotamia is a very beautiful animal, with its grey glossy coat and its lively and rapid action. If it is disturbed, it gives forth a cry, kicks up its heels and dashes off. When at a safe distance, it stops, turns round, and faces its pursuer. As soon as he approaches, it starts off again, stops, and takes to its heels again, continuing this procedure as long as it is followed. The Chaldeans found it difficult to catch by the aid of dogs, but they could bring it down by arrows, or perhaps catch it alive by stratagem. A running noose was thrown round its neck, and two men held the ends of the ropes. The animal struggled, made a rush, and attempted to bite, but its efforts tended only to tighten the noose still more firmly, and it at length gave in, half strangled, after alternating struggles and suffocating paroxysms, it became somewhat calmer, and it allowed itself to be led. It was finally tamed, if not to the extent of becoming useful in agriculture, at least for the purpose of war. Before the horse was known in Chaldea, it was used to draw the chariot. The original habitat of the horse was the great tableland of Central Asia. It is doubtful whether it was brought suddenly into the region of the Tigris and Euphrates by some barbaric invasion, or whether it was passed on from tribe to tribe, and thus gradually reached that country. It soon became acclimatized, and its cross-breeding with the ass led for centuries to the production of magnificent mules. The horse was known to the kings of Lagash, who used it in harness. The sovereigns of neighboring cities were also acquainted with it, but it seems to have been employed solely by the upper classes of society, and never to have been generally used in the war chariot or as a charger in cavalry operations. The Chaldeans carried agriculture to a high degree of perfection, and succeeded in obtaining from the soil everything it could be made to yield. Their methods, transmitted in the first place to the Greeks and afterwards to the Arabs, were perpetuated long after their civilization had disappeared, and were even practiced by the people of Iraq under the Abbasid Caliphs. Agricultural treatises on clay, which contained an account of these matters, were deposited in one or other of the sacred libraries in which the priests of each city were long accustomed to collect together documents from every source on which they could lay their hands. There were to be found in each of these collections a certain number of works which were unique, either because the authors were natives of the city, or because all copies of them had been destroyed in the course of centuries. The Epic of Gilgamesh, for instance, at Uruk, a history of the creation and of the battles of the gods with the monsters at Kutha. All of them had their special collection of hymns or psalms, religious and magical formulas, their lists of words and grammatical phraseology, their glossaries and syllabaries, which enabled them to understand and translate texts drawn up in Sumerian, or to decipher those whose writing presented more than ordinary difficulty. In these libraries there was, we find, as in the inscriptions of Egypt, a complete literature, of which only some scattered fragments have come down to us. The little we are able to examine has produced upon our modern investigators a complex impression, in which astonishment rather than admiration contends with a sense of tediousness. There may be recognized here and there, among the wearisome succession of phrases, with their rugged proper names, episodes which seem something like a Chaldean Genesis or Veda. Now and then a bold flight of fancy, a sudden exaltation of thought, or felicitous expression, arrests the attention and holds it captive for a time. In the narrative of the adventures of Gilgamesh, for instance, there is a certain nobility of character, and the sequence of events, in their natural and marvellous development, are handled with gravity and freedom. If we sometimes encounter episodes which provoke a smile or excite our repugnance, we must take into account the rudeness of the age with which they deal, and remember that the men and gods of the later Homeric epoch are not a whit behind the heroes of Babylonian story in coarseness. The recognition of divine omnipotence and the keenly felt afflictions of the soul awakened in the Chaldean psalmist feelings of adoration and penitence which still find, in spite of the differences of religion, an echo in our own hearts, and the unknown scribe who related the story of the descent of Ishtar to the infernal regions was able to express with a certain gloomy energy the miseries of the land without return. These instances are to be regarded, however, as exceptional. The bulk of Chaldean literature seems nothing more than a heap of pretentious trash, in which even the best-equipped reader can see no meaning, 
or, if he can, it is of such a character as to seem unworthy of record. His judgment is natural in the circumstances, for the ancient East is not, like Greece and Italy, the dead of yesterday whose soul still hovers around us, and whose legacies constitute more than half of our patrimony. On the contrary, it was buried soul and body, gods and cities, men and circumstances, ages ago, and even its heirs, in the lapse of years, have become extinct. In proportion as we are able to bring its civilization to light, we become more and more conscious that we have little or nothing in common with it. Its laws and customs, its methods of action and its modes of thought, are so far apart from those of the present day, that they seem to us to belong to a humanity utterly different from our own. The names of its deities do not appeal to our imagination like those of the Olympian cycle, and no traditional respect serves to do away with the sense of uncouthness which we experience from the jingle of syllables which enter into them. Its artists did not regard the world from the same point of view as we do, and its writers, drawing their inspiration from an entirely different source, made use of obsolete methods to express their feelings and coordinate their ideas. It thus happens that while we understand to a shade the classical language of the Greeks and Romans, and can read their works almost without effort, the great primitive literatures of the world, the Egyptian and Chaldean, have nothing to offer us for the most part but a sequence of problems to solve, or of enigmas to unriddle with patience. How many phrases, how many words at which we stumble, require a painstaking analysis before we can make ourselves master of their meaning? And even when we have determined to our satisfaction their literal signification, what a number of excursions we must make in the domain of religious, ethical, and political history, before we can compel them to render up to us their full import, or to make them as intelligible to others as they are to ourselves. When so many commentaries are required to interpret the thought of an individual or a people, some difficulty must be experienced in estimating the value of the expression which they have given to it. Elements of beauty were certainly, and perhaps are still within it, but in proportion as we clear away the rubbish which encumbers it, the mass of glossaries necessary to interpret it fall in and bury it so as to stifle it afresh. While the obstacles to our appreciation of Chaldean literature are of such a serious character, we are much more at home in our efforts to estimate the extent and depth of their scientific knowledge. They were as well versed as the Egyptians, but not more, in arithmetic and geometry, in as far as these had an application to the affairs of everyday life. The difference between the two peoples consisted chiefly in their respective numerical systems, the Egyptians employing almost exclusively the decimal system of notation, while the Chaldeans combined its use with the duodecimal. To express the units, they made use of so many vertical nails, placed one after or above each other. Tens were represented by bent brackets up to sixty. Beyond this figure they had the choice of two methods of notation. They could express the further tens by the continuous additions of brackets, or they could represent fifty by a vertical nail, and add for every additional ten a bracket to the right of it. The notation of a hundred was represented by the vertical nail with a horizontal stroke to the right, and the number of hundreds by the symbols placed before this sign. A thousand was written as ten times one hundred, and the series of thousands by the combination of different notations, which served to express units, tens, and hundreds. They subdivided the unit, moreover, into sixty equal parts, and each of these parts into sixty further equal subdivisions, and this system of fractions was used in all kinds of quantitative measurements. The fathom, the foot, and its square, talents and bushels, the complete system of Chaldean weights and measures, were based on intimate alliance and parallel use of the decimal and duodecimal system of notation. The sixtieth was more frequently employed than the hundredth when large quantities were in question. It was called a sauce, and ten sauces were equal to a nair, while sixty nairs were equivalent to a sar. The series, sauces, nairs, and sars, being employed in all estimations of values. Years and measures of length were reckoned in sauces, while talents and bushels were measured in sauces and sars. The fact that these subdivisions were all divisible by ten or twelve rendered calculations by means of them as easy to the merchant and workman as well as to the mathematical expert. The glimpses that we have been able to obtain up to the present of Chaldean scientific methods indicate that they were on a low level, but that they were sufficiently advanced to furnish practical rules for application in everyday affairs, helps to memory of different kinds, 
lists of figures with their names phonetically rendered in Sumerian and Semitic speech, tables of squares and cubes, and rudimentary formulas and figures for land surveying, furnish sufficient instructions to enable any one to make complicated calculations in a ready manner, and to work out in figures, with tolerable accuracy, the superficial area of irregularly shaped plots of land. The Chaldeans could draw out, with a fair amount of exactness, plans of properties or of towns, and their ambition impelled them even to attempt to make maps of the world. The latter were, it is true, but rough sketches, in which mythological beliefs vitiated the information which merchants and soldiers had collected in their journeys. The earth was represented as a disk surrounded by the ocean stream. Chaldea took up the greater part of it, and foreign countries did not appear in it at all, or held a position out in the cold at its extremities. Actual knowledge was woven in an extraordinary manner with mystic considerations, in which the virtues of numbers, their connections with the gods, and the application of geometrical diagrams to the prediction of the future played an important part. We know what a brilliant fortune these speculations attained in after years, and the firm hold they obtained for centuries over western nations, as formerly over the Bast. It was not in arithmetic and geometry alone, moreover, that the Chaldeans were led away by such deceits. Each branch of science in its turn was vitiated by them, and, indeed, it could hardly be otherwise when we come to consider the Chaldean outlook upon the universe. Its operations, in their eyes, were not carried on under impersonal and unswerving laws, but by voluntary and rational agents, swayed by an inexorable fate against which they dared not rebel, but still free enough and powerful enough to avert by magic the decrees of destiny, or at least to retard their execution. From this conception of things, each subordinate science was obliged to make its investigations in two perfectly distinct regions. It had at first to determine the material facts within its competence, such as the position of the stars, for instance, or the symptoms of a malady. It had then to discover the beings which revealed themselves through these material manifestations, their names and their characteristics. When once it had obtained this information, and could lay its hands upon them, it could compel them to work on its behalf. Science was thus nothing else than the application of magic to a particular class of phenomena. End of section 39. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 40 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 13. The number of astronomical facts with which the Chaldeans had made themselves acquainted was considerable. It was a question in ancient times whether they or the Egyptians had been the first to carry their investigations into the infinite depths of celestial space. When it came to be a question as to which of the two peoples had made greater progress in this branch of knowledge, all hesitation vanished, and the preeminence was accorded by the ancients to the priests of Babylon, rather than to those of Heliopolis and Memphis. The Chaldean priests had been accustomed from an early date to record on their clay tablets the aspect of the heavens and the changes which took place in them night after night. The appearance of the constellations, their comparative brilliancy, the precise moments of their rising and setting and culmination, together with the more or less rapid movements of the planets, and their motions towards or from one another. To their unaided eyes, sharpened by practice and favoured by the transparency of the air, many stars were visible, as to the Egyptians, which we can perceive only by the aid of the telescope. Those thousands of brilliant bodies, scattered apparently at random over the face of the sky, moved, however, with perfect regularity, and the period between their departure from and the return to the same point in the heavens was determined at an early date. Their position could be predicted at any hour, their course in the firmament being traced so accurately that its various stages were marked out and indicated beforehand. The moon, they discovered, had to complete two hundred and twenty-three revolutions of twenty-nine days and a half each, before it returned to the point from which it had set out. This period of its career being accomplished, it began a second of equal length, then a third, and so on, in an infinite series, during which it traversed the same celestial houses, and repeated in them the same acts of its life. All the eclipses which it had undergone in one period would again afflict it in another, 
and would be manifest in the same places of the earth in the same order of time. Whether they ascribed these eclipses to some mechanical cause, or regarded them as so many unfortunate attacks made upon sin by the seven, they recognized their periodical character, and they were acquainted with the system of the two hundred and twenty-three lunations by which their occurrence and duration could be predicted. Further observations encouraged the astronomers to endeavor to do for the sun what they had so successfully accomplished in regard to the moon. No long experience was needed to discover the fact that the majority of solar eclipses were followed some fourteen days and a half after by an eclipse of the moon, but they were unable to take sufficient advantage of this experience to predict with certainty the instant of a future eclipse of the sun, although they had been so struck with the connection of the two phenomena as to believe that they were in a position to announce it approximately. They were frequently deceived in their predictions, and more than one eclipse which they had promised did not take place at the time expected, but their successful prognostications were sufficiently frequent to console them for their failures, and to maintain the respect of the people and the rulers for their knowledge. Their years were vague years of three hundred and sixty days. The twelve equal months of which they were composed bore names which were borrowed, on the one hand, from events in civil life, such as Simanu from the making of brick, and Adaru from the sowing of seed, and on the other, from mythological occurrences whose origin is still obscure, such as Nisanu from the altar of Ea, and Ulul from a message of Ishtar. The adjustment of this year to astronomical demands was roughly carried out by the addition of a month every six years, which was called a second Adar, Blul, or Nisan, according to the place in which it was intercalated. The neglect of the hours and minutes in their calculation of the length of the year became with them, as with the Egyptians, a source of serious embarrassment, and we are still ignorant as to the means employed to meet the difficulty. The months had relations to the signs of the zodiac and the days composing them were made up of twelve double hours each. The Chaldeans had invented two instruments, both of them of a simple character to measure time, the clepsydra and the solar clock, the latter of which in later times became the source of the Greek polos. The sundial served to determine a number of simple facts which were indispensable in astronomical calculations, such as the four cardinal points, the meridian of the place, the solstitial and equinoctial epochs, and the elevation of the pole at the position of observation. The construction of the sundial and clepsydra, if not the polos also, is doubtless to be referred back to a very ancient date, but none of the text already brought to light makes mention of the employment of these instruments. All these discoveries, which constitute in our eyes the scientific patrimony of the Chaldeans, were regarded by themselves as the least important results of their investigations. Did they not know, thanks to these investigations, that the stars shone for other purposes than to lighten up the nights, to rule, in fact, the destinies of men and kings, and in ruling that of kings, to determine the fortune of empires? Their earliest astronomers, by their assiduous contemplation of the nightly heavens, had come to the conclusion that the vicissitudes of the heavenly bodies were in fixed relations, with mundane phenomena and events. If Mercury, for instance, displayed an unusual brilliancy at his rising, and his disk appeared as a two-edged sword, riches and abundance, due to the position of the luminous halo which surrounded him, would be scattered over Chaldea, while discords would cease therein, and justice would triumph over iniquity. The first observer who was struck by this coincidence noted it down. His successors confirmed his observations, and at length deduced, in the process of the years, from their accumulated knowledge, a general law. Henceforward, each time that Mercury assumed the same aspect, it was a favorable augury, and kings and their subjects became the recipients of his bounty. As long as he maintained this appearance, no foreign ruler could install himself in Chaldea. Tyranny would be divided against itself, equity would prevail, and a strong monarch bear sway while the landholders and the king would be confirmed in their privileges, and obedience, together with tranquillity, would rule everywhere in the land. The number of these observations increased to such a degree that it was found necessary to classify them methodically to avoid confusion. Tables of them were drawn up, in which the reader could see at one and the same moment the aspect of the heavens on such and such a night and hour, and the corresponding events, either then happening or about to happen, in Chaldea, Syria, or some foreign land. If, for instance, the moon displayed the same appearance on the first and twenty-seventh of the month, 
Elam was threatened. But if the sun at his setting appears double his usual size, with three groups of bluish rays, the king of Chaldea is ruined. To the indications of the heavenly bodies, the Chaldeans added the portents which could be deduced from atmospheric phenomena. If it thundered on the twenty-seventh of Tammuz, the wheat harvest would be excellent and the produce of the ears magnificent. But if this should occur six days later, that is, on the second of Abu, floods and rains were to be apprehended in a short time, together with the death of the king and the division of his empire. It was not for nothing that the sun and moon surrounded themselves in the evening with blood-red vapors, or veiled themselves in dark clouds, that they grew suddenly pale or red after having been intensely bright, that unexpected fires blazed out on the confines of the air, and that on certain nights the stars seemed to have become detached from the firmament and to be falling upon the earth. These prodigies were so many warnings granted by the gods to the people and their kings before great crises in human affairs. The astronomer investigated and interpreted them, and his predictions had a greater influence than we are prepared to believe upon the fortunes of individuals and even of states. The rulers consulted and imposed upon the astronomers the duty of selecting the most favorable moment for the execution of the projects they had in view. From an early date each temple contained a library of astrological writings, where the people might find, drawn up as in a code, the signs which bore upon their destinies. One of these libraries, consisting of not less than seventy clay tablets, is considered to have been first drawn up in the reign of Sargon of Agade, but to have been so modified and enriched with new examples from time to time that the original is well nigh lost. This was the classical work on the subject in the seventh century before our era, and the astronomers, royal, to whom applications were accustomed to be made to explain a natural phenomenon or a prodigy, drew their answers ready-made from it. Astronomy, as thus understood, was not merely the queen of sciences, it was the mistress of the world, taught secretly in the temples, its adepts, at least, those who had passed through the regular curriculum of study which it required, became almost a distinct class in society. The occupation was a lucrative one, and its accomplished professors had numerous rivals whose educational antecedents were unknown, but who excited the envy of the experts in their trading upon the credulity of the people. These quacks went about the country drawing up horoscopes, and arranging schemes of birthday prognostications, of which the majority were without any authentic warranty. The law sometimes took note of the fact that they were competing with the official experts, and interfered with their business. But if they happened to be exiled from one city, they found some neighboring one ready to receive them. End of section 40. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 41 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 3. Chaldean Civilization, Part 14. Chaldea abounded with soothsayers and necromancers no less than with astrologers. She possessed no real school of medicine, such as we find in Egypt, in which were taught rational methods of diagnosing maladies and of curing them by the use of simples. The Chaldeans were content to confide the care of their bodies to sorcerers and exorcists, who were experts in the art of casting out demons and spirits, whose presence in a living being brought about those disorders to which humanity is prone. The facial expression of the patient during the crisis, the words which escaped him in delirium, were, for these clever individuals, so many signs revealing the nature and sometimes the name of the enemy to be combated, the fever god, the plague god, the headache god, Consultations and medical treatment were, therefore, religious offices, in which were involved purifications, offerings, and a whole ritual of mysterious words and gestures. The magician lighted a fire of herbs and sweet-smelling plants in front of his patient, and the clear flame arising from this put the spectres to flight, and dispelled the malign influences, a prayer describing the enchantments and their effects being afterwards recited. The baleful imprecation, like a demon, has fallen upon a man, wail and pain have fallen upon him, direful wail has fallen upon him, the baleful imprecation, the spell, the pains in the head. This man, the baleful imprecation, slaughters him like a sheep, for his god has quitted his body, his goddess has withdrawn herself in displeasure from him. 
a wail of pain has spread himself as a garment upon him and has overtaken him. The harm done by the magician, though terrible, could be repaired by the gods, and Merodach was moved to compassion betimes. Merodach cast his eyes on the patient. Merodach entered into the house of his father Ea, saying, My father, the baleful curse has fallen like a demon upon the man. Twice he thus speaks, and then adds, What this man ought to do I know not. How shall he be healed? Ea replies to his son Merodach, My son, what is there that I could add to thy knowledge? Merodach, what is there that I could add to thy knowledge? That which I know thou knowest it. Go then, my son Merodach, lead him to the house of purification of the god who prepares remedies, and break the spell that is upon him. Draw away the charm which is upon him, the ill which afflicts his body, which he suffers by reason of the curse of his father, or the curse of his mother, or the curse of his eldest brother, or by the curse of a murderess who is unknown to the man, the curse may it be taken from him by the charm of Ea, like a clove of garlic, which is stripped skin by skin, like a cluster of dates may it be cut off, like a bunch of flowers may it be uprooted, the spell may heaven avert it, may the earth avert it. The god himself deigned to point out the remedy, the sick man was to take a clove of garlic, some dates, and a stalk bearing flowers, and was to throw them into the fire bit by bit, repeating appropriate prayers at each stage of the operation. In like manner as this garlic is peeled and thrown into the fire, and the burning flame consumes it, as it will never be planted in the vegetable garden, it will never draw moisture from the pond or from the ditch, its root will never again spread in the earth, its stalk will not pierce the ground and behold the sun, it will not serve as food for the gods or the king, so may it remove the baleful curse, so may it loose the bond of sickness, of sin, of shortcomings, of perversity, of crime. The sickness which is in my body, in my flesh, in my muscles, like this garlic, may it be stripped off, and may the burning flame consume it in this day. May the spell of the sorcerer be cast out, that I may behold the light. The ceremony could be prolonged at will. The sick person pulled to pieces the cluster of dates, the bunch of flowers, a fleece of wool, some goat's hair, a skein of dyed thread, and a bean, which were all in turn consumed in the fire. At each stage of the operation he repeated the formula, introducing into it one or two expressions characterizing the nature of the particular offering. As, for instance, the dates will no more hang from their stalks, the leaves of the branch will never again be united to the tree, the wool and the hair will never again lie on the back of the animal on which they grew, and will never be used for weaving garments. The use of magical words was often accompanied by remedies, which were for the most part both grotesque and disgusting in their composition. They comprised bitter or stinking wood shavings, raw meat, snake's flesh, wine and oil, the whole reduced to a pulp, or made into a sort of pill and swallowed on the chance of its bringing relief. The Egyptian physicians employed similar compounds, to which they attributed wonderful effects, but they made use of them in exceptional circumstances only. The medical authorities in Chaldea recommended them before all others, and their very strangeness reassured the patient as to their efficacy. They filled the possessing spirits with disgust, and became a means of relief, owing to the invincible horror with which they inspired the persecuting demons. The Chaldeans were not, however, ignorant of the natural virtues of herbs, and at times made use of them, but they were not held in very high esteem, and the physicians preferred the prescriptions which pandered to the popular craving for the supernatural. Amulets further confirmed the effect produced by the recipes, and prevented the enemy, once cast out, from re-entering the body. These amulets were made of knots of cord, pierced shells, bronze or terracotta statuettes, and plaques fastened to the arms or worn round the neck. On each of the latter kind were roughly drawn the most terrible images that they could conceive. A shortened incantation was scrawled on its surface, or it was covered with extraordinary characters, which, when the spirits perceived, they at once took flight, and the possessor of the talisman escaped the threatened illness. However laughable, and at the same time deplorable, this hopeless medley of exact knowledge and gross superstition may appear to us at the present day, it was the means of bringing a prosperity to the cities of Chaldea, which no amount of actual science would ever have produced. The neighboring barbaric peoples were imbued with the same ideas as the Chaldeans, regarding the constitution of the world and the nature of the laws which governed it. They lived likewise in perpetual fear of those invisible beings, whose changeable and arbitrary will actuated all visible phenomena. They attributed all the reverses and misfortunes which overtook them to the direct action of these malevolent beings. 
they believed firmly in the influence of the stars on the course of events. They were constantly on the lookout for prodigies, and were greatly alarmed by them, since they had no certain knowledge of the number and nature of their enemies, and the means they had invented for protecting themselves from these, or of overcoming them, too often proved inefficient. In the eyes of these barbarians, the Chaldeans seemed to be possessed of the very powers which they themselves lacked. The magicians of Chaldea had forced the demons to obey them, and to unmask themselves before them. They read with ease in the heavens the present and future of men and nations. They interpreted the will of the immortals in its smallest manifestations, and with them this faculty was not a limited and ephemeral power, quickly exhausted by use. The rites and formulas known to them enabled them to exercise it freely at all times, in all places, alike upon the most exalted of the gods and the most dreaded of mortals, without its ever becoming weakened. A race so endowed with wisdom was, indeed, destined to triumph over its neighbors, and the latter would have no chance of resisting such a nation unless they borrowed from it its manners, customs, industry, writing, and all the arts and sciences which had brought about their superiority. Chaldean civilization spread into Elam and took possession of the inhabitants of the shores of the Persian Gulf, and then, since its course was impeded on the south by the sea, on the west by the desert, and on the east by the mountains, it turned in the direction of the great northern plains and proceeded up the two rivers, beside whose lower waters it had been cradled. It was at this very time that the pharaohs of the thirteenth dynasty had just completed the conquest of Nubia. Greater Egypt, made what she was by the efforts of twenty generations, had become an African power. The sea formed her northern boundary, the desert and the mountains enclosed her on all sides, and the Nile appeared the only natural outlet into a new world. She followed it indefatigably from one cataract to another, colonizing as she passed all the lands fertilized by its waters. Every step which she made in this direction increased the distance between her capitals and the Mediterranean, and brought her armies further south. Asia would have practically ceased to exist, as far as Egypt was concerned, had not the repeated incursions of the Bedouin obliged her to make advances from time to time in that direction. Still, she crossed the frontier as seldom as possible, and recalled her troops as soon as they had reduced the marauders to order. Ethiopia alone attracted her, and it was there that she firmly established her empire. The two great civilized peoples of the ancient world, therefore, had each their field of action clearly marked out and neither of them had ever ventured into that of the other. There had been no lack of intercourse between them, if it ever really had taken place, had been accidental, had merely produced passing results, and up till then had terminated without bringing to either side a decisive advantage. End of section 41. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 42 of History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria, Volume 3, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Appendix. Pharaonic Lists. The Pharaohs of the Ancient and Middle Empires. Dynasties 1 through 14. The lists of the Pharaohs of the Memphite period appear to have been drawn up in much the same order as we now possess them, as early as the Twelfth Dynasty. It is certain that the sequence was definitely fixed about the time of the twentieth dynasty, since it was under this that the canon of Turin was copied. The lists which have come down to us appear to follow two traditions, which differ completely in certain cases. One has been preserved for us by the abbreviators of Manetho, while the other was the authority followed by the compilers of the tables of Abydos and Saqqara, as well as by the author of the Turin Papyrus. There appear to have been in the first five dynasties a certain number of kings whose exact order and filiation were supposed to be well known to the compilers, but at the same time there were others whose names were found on the monuments, but whose position with regard to their predecessors was indicated neither by historical documents nor by popular romance. We find, therefore, in these two traditional lists a series of sovereigns always occupying the same position, and others hovering around them who have no decided place. The hieroglyphic lists and the royal canon appear to have been chiefly concerned with the former, but the authorities followed by Manetho have studiously collected the names of the latter, and have intercalated them in different places, sometimes in the middle, but mostly at the end of the dynasty, where they form a kind of caput mortuum. The most striking example of this arrangement is afforded to us in the fourth dynasty. 
the contemporary monuments show that its kings formed a compact group, to which are appended the first three sovereigns of the fifth dynasty, always in the same order. Mankari succeeded Khafri, Shapsiska followed Mankari, Yusurkov followed Shapsivskov, and so on to the end. The lists of Manetho suppress Shapsiskov, and substitute four other individuals in his place, namely Katoesis, Bikhiris, Sibrikaris, Thamsis, whose reigns must have occupied more than half a century. These four were doubtless aspirants to the throne, or local kings belonging to the time between the fourth and fifth dynasties, whom Manetho's authorities inserted between the compact groups made up of Cheops and his sons on the one hand, and of Yusurkov and his two real or supposed brothers on the other, omitting Shopsiskov, and having no idea that Yusurkov was his immediate successor, with or without rivals to the throne. In a course of lectures given at the Collège de France, 1893-1895, to I have examined at length the questions raised by a study of the various lists, and I may be able, perhaps, some day, to publish the result of my researches. For the present, I must confine myself merely to what is necessary to the elucidation of the present work, namely, the Menethonian tradition on the one hand, and the tradition of the monumental tables on the other. The text which I propose to follow for the latter, during the first five dynasties, is that of the second table of Abydos. The names placed between brackets are taken either from the table of Saqqara, or from the royal canon of Turin. The numbers of the years, months, and days are those furnished by the last-mentioned document. From the sixth to the twelfth dynasty, the lists of Manetho are at fault. They give the origin and duration of the dynasties, without furnishing us with the names of the kings. This blank is partially filled by the table of Abydos, by the fragments of the Turin papyrus, and by information supplied by the monuments. No such definitely established sequence appears to have existed for this period as for the preceding ones. The Heracleopolitan dynasties figure, perhaps, in the canon of Turin only. As for the later Memphite dynasties, the table of Abydos gives one series of pharaohs, while the canon adopts a different one. After the close of the sixth dynasty, and before the accession of the ninth, there was doubtless a period when several branches of the royal family claimed the supremacy, and ruled in different parts of Egypt. This is what we know to have taken place later, between the twenty-second and the twenty-fourth dynasties. The tradition of Abydos had, perhaps, adopted one of these contemporaneous dynasties, while the Turin papyrus had chosen another. Manetho, on the other hand, had selected from among them, as representatives of the legitimate succession, the line reigning at Memphis, which immediately followed the sovereigns of the sixth dynasty. The following table gives both the series known, as far as it is possible for the present to re-establish the order. The eleventh Theban dynasty contains but a small number of kings according to the official lists. The tables on the monuments recognize only two, Nibkuri and Sandkari, but the Turin canon admits at least half a dozen. These differences probably arose from the fact that the second Heracleopolitan dynasty, having reigned at the same time as the earlier Theban princes, the tables on the monuments, while rejecting the Heracleopolitans, recognized as legitimate pharaohs only those of the Theban kings who had ruled over the whole of Egypt, namely, the first and last of the series. The canon, on the contrary, replaced the later Heracleopolitans by those among the contemporary Thebans who had assumed the royal titles. Whatever may have been the cause of these combinations, we find the lists again harmonizing with the accession of the twelfth Theban dynasty. For the succeeding dynasties we possess merely the names enumerated on the fragments of the Turin papyrus, several of which, however, are also found either on the royal chamber at Karnak, or on contemporary monuments. The order of the names is not always certain. It is, perhaps, best to transcribe the sequence as we are able to gather it from the fragments of the royal papyrus, without attempting to distinguish between those which belong to the thirteenth, and those which must be relegated to the following dynasties. About fifty names still remain, but so mutilated and scattered over such small fragments of papyrus that their order is most uncertain. We possess monuments of about one-fifth of these kings, and the lengths of their reigns. As far as we know them, all appear to have been short. We have no reason to doubt that they did really govern, 
and we can only hope that in time the progress of excavation will yield us records of them one after another. They bring us down to the period of the invasion of the shepherds, and it is possible that some among them may be found to be contemporaries of the 15th and 16th dynasties. End of section 42 End of volume 3 of the History of Egypt, Chaldea, Syria, Babylonia, and Assyria by Gaston Maspero Read by Professor Heather and By in Carrollton, Georgia, in December 2009. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.